So I think it's time to move on now with the, uh, the scientific part of the uh, of the program. Um, we're a little bit behind schedule, so if you keep to the timetable, it would be good. So we schedule 35 minutes for the talk and five minutes for questions. So if you have questions, either put them in the chat box or save them in the end, uh, to the end. Um, we will obviously not have a lot of time for a lot of questions, but it's always nice to have some questions uh, at least. Um, so we start with Peter Braun Münziger um, on the QCD phase diagram. Thank you very much uh, for this opportunity to say a few words about uh, Jochen and a lot about common interest in physics, which we had. And I've uh, essentially entitled my contribution the QCD phase diagram 20 years, 27 years of efforts to establish a connection between nuclear collision data and the QCD phase boundary. I'll not read all the um, outline here, just to say that I'll start with some historical comments, then uh, actually go uh, over to what we have learned most recently. Um, and then, uh, of course, in the middle of all of that, uh, Jochen will appear and will play important roles and they'll actually try to lead you to the most recent achievements in our quest to understand the QCD phase diagram. So I start with a very personal statement here uh, for Jochen. I think we <clears throat> were for more than 20 years, actually close to 25 years on the, on the faculty at Technical University Darmstadt. And we had practically, and I really mean that, continuous discussions on the QCD phase diagram. Um, this actually led to our only joint publication, apart from more um, <clears throat> contributions in German to, to other things. Um, and uh, for that publication in reviews of modern physics, uh, we spent a lot of time trying to really understand what is going on here and teach each other, he, me on the theory, and I try to tell him on the intricate difficulties of the measurements. And I'm happy to say, I think, at least from my point of view, this is still a reference point for all research on the QCD phase diagram. Now, as I said, I would like to bring you, Jochen, up to date on our thinking, uh, what, how things have evolved and where we are. And I hope that you enjoy this discussion. I uh, also uh, challenge you to find out where this picture was taken and we can maybe discuss it at some other occasion. <clears throat> so without further ado, uh, QCD phase diagram. Um, that started off uh, in serious, serious ways um, in the early to mid 90s. Uh, actually, the first paper I can think of, uh, apart from more historical comments and theoretical attempts uh, when QCD was invented, um, is by Jean Clemens, unfortunately, the late Jean Clemens and Helmut Satz. Uh, in which they try to analyze the, the abundance of strange particles in the then uh, only rather crude experimental efforts to understand strange particle production in high energy collisions. Uh, they analyze data from the WA85 and NE35 collaboration from CERN at the time. And uh, they found that uh, there is some <clears throat> interesting details, but actually the data and the results uh, proved to be inconclusive. And so no consistent analysis was possible. Uh, so one could not tell whether this was because the data were inconsistent, because the data exhibited uh, traces of uh, non-equilibrium in there because of particular selection of particles and so on. So the next step then came from when we started uh, for analysis of hadrons produced in light iron 
nucleus collisions at the HES, so in this particular case, silicon plus lead or gold. And uh, out of this came actually a first uh, consistent analysis, which indicated that maybe the particles are produced at a temperature around 120 MeV and the baryochemical potential of 540 MeV. And I don't want you to read this whole table here, but within let's say 30 to 40% uh, things prove to be quite consistent with such an analysis. Let me, oops, sorry, I have to be careful with my hands here. I'm going the wrong direction. <clears throat> um, I just want to point out that already at that time, we had anti-deuteron to anti-proton, which seemed to agree much to our surprise uh, because anti-deuteron is a, a weakly bound uh, anti-nucleus, much to our surprise seemed to agree quite nicely with, with uh, what we had actually computed. Um, so this actually led to the first uh, entry in a phase diagram, as far as I can tell, first connection between experimental data and QCD phase diagram from these two publications here. Um, uh, Nota Bene, uh, we plotted uh, latent heat in here from a back model, uh, of course, assuming that the transition is uh, first order. We have no idea whether the transition at HES energy is first order or not, but uh, at the time crossover phase transitions did not exist. And uh, so, but still this looked like something interesting to follow up. And so uh, we said to ourselves, well, we'll have to get a lot more data to really make this point convincing. So <clears throat> next. What happened now? So next uh, steps were to try to collect data from SPS, HES, and CIS-100. Uh, and that sort of established the first experimental freeze-out curve, as you can see here, this is 1998. And uh, immediately after, Jean Clemens and Christoph Redlich joined in and provided a first interpretation of this freeze out curve, which in fact was an interesting interpretation, but not in any way connected, at least at first sight, to QCD. While our line here, this line here, um, was calculated again with a back model, sort of at least QCD inspired. We will come back to this. So by now I will make a fast forward to the collider era and uh, our attempts and show you our attempts to attack the QCD phase diagram uh, with precision data uh, from <coughs> the LHC. So uh, of course uh, this I don't need to discuss except that we collide lead nuclei at the LHC and in fact um, per unit of rapidity, we create about 2000 charged hadrons and integrated over the full collision, integrated over full central lead, lead collision at LHC energy, more than 32,000 uh, particles are produced at top LHC energy. So uh, to talk about macroscopic properties like temperature and the density and so on, really makes sense at the LHC uh, and we can actually handle it experimentally as this picture here shows. And uh, we can not only handle it experimentally um, by tracking, but we can also identify all particles. And this is a proton-proton collision, 13 TeV proton-proton. And uh, it's now the PDG standard for particle identification with the ALICE TPC, but I show it here because in addition to electrons, muons, pions, kaons, and protons, you see copious production of deuterium and triton. And initially our high energy colleagues had actually tried to convince us that at TeV energies, no particles like that are bound, loosely bound like deuteron and triton would be produced at all. Uh, you can just look at 
the result and you can convince yourself optically that that is not correct. So this is the latest. This is March 25, 2021. And Jochen, I promised that I would run you also through some of the latest technology to attack the QCD phase diagram. This is uh, the inerts of the Alice detector with the big red, red magnet 12 meters high. You see a person here. You see in blue the Alice TPC, which has had been taken out for this shutdown and has been refurbished with uh, new readout chambers based on gems. And uh, the delicate task of actually putting it back into the experiment had just been completed at that point. But you see a gaping hole where the silicon tracker is. And uh, <clears throat> actually, this was when the TPC was already out. So I should not have gone one step back. So without TPC, with TPC, with, without tracker. And now this in the new and highly sophisticated silicon inner tracker is being uh, inserted and you can see here the team of people awaiting uh, that uh, tracker. It's a very, very delicate undertaking and that tracker uh, consists essentially of massless silicon detectors uh, to make uh, much more precise measurements of vertices and tracks near the interaction vertex than we could have done in the first 10 years of ALICE. So we really look forward to that and we'll get an even more precise, precise information on what is actually gone, going on in these collisions and with much higher statistics than we couldn't do before. So um, of course now this is summarizing how we go on Hartron production and the QCD phase boundary by measuring all momenta of all produced particles and uh, really look for signs of equilibration, phase transitions and so on. Um, using essentially, as it looks like a very simple uh, QCD partition function uh, over the full hydronic mass spectrum. The details, however, are much more complicated as you will see in a second. Uh, but the final result, uh, this is the final result as of 2019. Uh, including the newest developments from physics letters B 2019 shows that at LHC energy, at the highest energy, we have actually uh, access to full particle identification. The data at 5T, we are still not analyzed fully and completely. So we only have data to show at 2.76, um, shows that uh, in such a collision of lead nuclei, central collision of lead nuclei at the highest energy. We have pions, kaons, phi mesons, protons, lambdas, cascades, omegas, deuterons, helium-3, hypertriton, helium-4, and all the antiparticles. And all of that over nine orders of magnitude. And uh, with the statistical hydronization approach, we understand that production takes place at a temperature of 156.6 plus minus 1.7 MeV. The areochemical potential is consistent with zero. And the volume of one unit of rapidity uh, is about 4,000 cubic fermis. And the description is practically perfect. And there is really only one parameter. If you like, you could have just put mu b equals to zero. Um, now, it is important to recognize A, now that means matter and antimatter is produced at same proportions. Uh, and that is also implying that very fragile anti and nuclear and anti nuclear, like hypertriton, are produced um, at the apparent temperatures of 156 MeV. Um, there is still a very big and uh, interesting discussion going on in the community as to what in detail that means. I'll give you my take on it in a little bit. Uh, but the, in order to actually get to that agreement, we had to deal with a discrepancy of the order of 20%. Now you should recognize that the RIC data have an overall accuracy of 20% and therefore would never have seen any of that. 
but at the LHC, we have something like six or so percent. And so a discrepancy between 6% and 20% amounts to 2.7 sigma difference. And that was taken very seriously. But the so-called proton puzzle was resolved by uh, getting good old Hadron physics to the rescue. Namely, um, as I showed here, uh, in a gas of hadrons, you cannot just completely ignore the of the hadrons and the formalism for that was worked out in the 60s by Daschen, Ma, and Bernstein, a very famous paper in which they showed that the thermal yield of an interacting resonance uh, is actually um, modified uh, from that of a uh, delta function bright Wigner resonance by using this approach here that instead of a delta function, you should use this coefficient bij of m, which is two times the derivative of the phase shifts uh, of with respect to mass. And so if you want to implement that, we did actually the complete world's uh, summary of all pion nucleon phase shifts with thermal weights for n stars and deltas. That's only for those that there is enough data to do that. And you see here how this Hartron resonance spectrum then comes out. And you see that the delta is a perfect resonance. The n star 1520 is essentially a perfect resonance. But delta 1620 is not. And there are certainly for others, you already see quite significant deviations. If you take these deviations into account seriously, and I have to say also that Hochmann Low from Wart, uh, from uh, Krakow, uh, from Breslau, from Wrocław, helped us very much, and uh, uh, together with uh, Christoph Redlich to actually uh, settle this issue. We can understand all these particle production, and uh, <clears throat> you see that the picture becomes even much simpler if we uh, plot the particle production yield normalized to the spin degeneracy versus mass, because at LHC energy, it's only mass that counts. There is no um, difference between strange particles and non-strange particles. And uh, so that all sits on this uh, line here. And the complete, taking into account the complete resonance decays leads to these bars, which we actually compute here. And uh, I think that is tells you convincingly that the nature of this particle production is really thermal. Now, um, <clears throat> the energy dependence, uh, of course, uh, we could also understand in detail. And you see here from take plotting the baryochemical potential and the temperature versus energy, each data point here is taken. Oops, each data point is taken by a coll collaboration. Um, so typically a few hundred people working for two years. So um, this is the data point at the LHC. These are RIC data points. These are um, SPS uh, data points. And these are um, HES uh, data points. And uh, I think analyzing all this leads to a very simple systematics, namely that the temperature uh, which you analyze from this uh, particle production actually increases to about 150 MeV or 160 MeV and then stays constant. Note the log scale here, stays constant over a huge uh, range of center of mass energies uh, from, from the two, 2000 GeV to something like um, 10 GeV here, and below it drops, and the, while the baryochemical potential just uh, disappears smoothly, and really this looks like what we what Hagedorn had uh, thought about of the boiling point of uh, atomic matter. You put more and more energy in, eventually the temperature stays constant, uh, but the matter becomes more and more symmetric between baryons and antibaryons. Um, so this is really looking like a phase diagram already from that point of view. 
And we can not only understand that, but all the particle ratios, I will not go into any further detail here. And even compare this to the most recent high precision prediction from lattice QCD, this, this purple line here. Um, and uh, and uh, you see that uh, that actually agrees also quite nicely with the LAC points. There is a little discrepancy, oops, there's a little discrepancy uh, with the RIC data points, which I believe we understand, but I don't want to discuss any further. Um, let me say that while this all happened, uh, very influential papers appeared uh, by Jochen Mombach and Ralf Rapp on the chiral restoration transition and its relation to low mass leptons. And let me just go back to steps here and, and, and make you aware of the fact that all sorts of particles on here are in here, but you don't find the row meson. The row meson, of course, is uh, one of the prominent hadrons, and you can ask yourself why it is not in there. Uh, it has a very good reason, but I will not dwell on this at the moment, but let me say that uh, <clears throat> exactly that Romeson, which does not show up in our data analysis, it was actually the center of Jochen's attention for something like 20 years. And the culmination of that is a series of papers, which you see here, um, published in Landolt Bernstein 2010. And of course, the first important uh, advance in explaining the rho meson production in terms of in medium rho meson spectral functions appeared in 2000 uh, compared here to data from Ceres and data from NE60. And this uh, surprising result uh, tells you that the, in, that the spe spectral function of rho mesons actually changes significantly inside the medium and this a significant change is actually quantitatively understood by the interaction of the in medium row with uh, the surrounding nucleons mostly. Uh, gluon plasma and other contributions are actually very small. And I should point out that this paper here is one of the most cited papers in nuclear physics and has shaped the direction uh, of that field uh, very much. In fact, I should tell you that <clears throat> at that time when this came out, everybody assumed that these measurements are so difficult that they can never be done at LAC energy. I should uh, come back to this in the end because actually I'd like to um, hopefully convince Jochen that the next order of business in this field here with the Rome is on is actually to understand the new LAC data, which have come out and will come out over the next two years and which in precision will actually be at least as good as all the data before, despite the fact that we have a huge number of particles to deal with. So um, let me just conclude on the doorway state hypothesis and how one can possibly explain that these uh, loosely bound objects are also produced at high temperatures. Uh, and uh, here, the <clears throat> our hypothesis is that maybe these states are formed as virtual compact multi-quark states at the phase boundary, which then slowly evolve into their hadronic representation. This is something which we published in Nature, and this is uh, yet to be uh, confirmed experimentally. Uh, but I think this is something which will shape the next steps uh, of our research and will also be very important for GSI FAIR and Gina Nika and other experiments. So I will conclude uh, with a few more comments on what happens if we add charm into the equation. Um, now, we already knew since uh, the year 2000 that adding charm into the equation becomes an interesting game. Uh, not so much because of what was thought about in terms of uh, 
um, disappearing shape psi, but rather uh, uh, conversely, because we actually thought that maybe charm would in the end drive the charmonia to appear again and not disappear. So to make that story short, we actually see here that compared to, <clears throat> to uh, other hadrons, if we plot them into the same plot, the shape psi, if we just deal with it as a experimental entity, the shape psi is about a factor of thousand above the line uh, of the thermal production. Now, where is this coming from? This is coming from the fact that charm quarks are not produced thermally, but at LHC energy, uh, there is copious production of charm in hadron initial heart collisions which subsequently thermalize in the firewall. And that means that you can treat the charm quarks essentially as impurities which have their own numbers independent of the temperature. And if you actually do that, you get a fugacity factor of 30, that is enhancement factor of 30 for, for each single charm quark. So for D0, we have to multiply the thermal production with a factor of 30. And for shape psi, because it contains two of those quarks, we have to multiply it with 900. And in fact, the blue point here is exactly if you take that modification of the statistical hadronization model into account, the blue is exactly where we had predicted it should appear. Um, <clears throat> so that well, is also that telling you, that agreement tells you also that this must mean that the charm quarks are actually deconfined in the medium. And uh, it's actually first direct proof of quark deconfinement. Uh, this is more in detail um, how this model actually worked out. Uh, actually originated from the first publication by us, but uh, I want to highlight uh, an important role which Jochen played in that game. Maybe he has forgotten. But we had at the time a RNM meeting, which stands for Rhein Necker Mine Meeting, where all the institutes interested in relativistic nuclear collisions and uh, centered around Darmstadt, Frankfurt, Heidelberg uh, were actually represented. And uh, on 13th of July 2000, Jochen. Lambach, as you can see here, organized a meeting of that group here in which uh, the following talks took place. And you see here there is non-thermal aspects of charmonium and shape psi production. There is Kopeljovic on charmonium in photo production, Marek Atstitsky on thermal production of charm. Oops, sorry. And and uh, Dosh from Heidelberg on shape psi physics in the model of stochastic vacuum. And I remember, and I hope Jochen remembers that that was a very memorable meeting with very, very, very strong discussions and uh, sort of got us uh, all going into the direction I will just show you in the next minutes. Uh, so indeed at LHC Energy, um, we, uh, find not that shape psi is, uh, is suppressed, but in fact, in terms of this nuclear modification factor, there is more shape psi at mid rapidity than at forward rapidity. There is more shape psi at low transverse momentum than at high transverse momentum. And uh, there is much more shape psi at LHC energy compared to RIC energy. And that is exactly what we had actually produced, uh, predicted. Uh, so uh, <clears throat> that means one can actually go one step further and uh, uh, extend this prediction, not only for charmonia, but also for open for and hidden charm, for all open and hidden charm particles in the lead collisions. There is a new, uh, a collaboration here and hopefully I will just show, share a few, a few slides with it before to conclude. So um, 
you can see that with the statistical harmonization of charm, we can, without any new parameters, apart from the measured charm production cross section in PP collisions, we can really quite well uh, describe all the data. Um, here is the prediction for lambda c. Unfortunately, I can't put data on it because it's not yet cleared by the Alice collaboration, but that those data will come out very soon. Um, here are ratios of d plus to d0, d plus star um, to d0, ds to d0, and lambda c to d0. And you see wherever we have data, it actually agrees very nicely with our prediction, which are parameterless. Uh, and we will see what happens to the lambda c case. And uh, let me show you that actually out of this game comes a complete multi-charm hierarchy. You will see we can actually predict all these states here, not just d0, but uh, also cascade zero, omega c zero, um, all the chip size states, but omega cc and even omega ccc, that is an omega made of three charm quarks. And if we again plot those uh, divided by the, the spin degeneracy factor versus mass, you see the hierarchy of single charm, double charm, and triple charm. And this is what we would like to actually uh, test. Uh, in the next uh, five or so years, uh, eight years at the LHC and see whether that actually works out. Let me give you a particular example, which is now in everybody's mind, namely the X3872, which has, uh, is, there is a raging debate that this state here, uh, which has first been seen by Bell, uh, there's a raging debate that this is a four quark state with two charm quarks. Um, you can see here the quantum numbers uh, measured by the LHCB collaboration. And we have actually used our model to compute what's the angular distribution or rather PT distribution for that state should be. And again, there should be some huge enhancement at low transverse momentum. And we look forward to testing this uh, experimentally, even though these measurements will be very, very difficult. So um, <clears throat> statistical hadronization works not only for patrons with up, down, and uh, strange quarks, but also with charm quarks and contributes to an, our understanding uh, of the phase boundary. Um, Charm quarks are deconfined. That is also experimentally clear, but the study of open charm production with multi charm hadrons has just begun. And we'll see what uh, will actually come from that. Uh, of course, uh, <clears throat> it would be interesting to see whether beauty can also be treated in similar ways. Uh, that is all something we would like to look forward to uh, test uh, in the course of the prediction. and. Uh, uh, the Alice experiment is now upgraded such that we will take a factor of 50 more data than what was possible in the first 10 years. And we will focus on these objects. And I should say the focus is not just on these objects, but also, and that will interest you on, on low mass leptons. And in fact, we can go down in transverse momentum to something like 100 MeV or even 75 MeV already now with the present setup and with the next set setup. And uh, I think this should produce precision measurements of uh, what happens to the raw meson at LHC energy. And I hope very much that Jochen will join in with his uh, experience to help in the understanding of what is coming out from those data. We'd like to decipher QCD in the strongly coupled regime. And Jochen, we need all the help we can get. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter. Thanks a lot. Um, we have time for a few questions. Um, either just speak or raise your hand via the reaction button. OK, Marek has a question. Sorry, Marek, yeah. Yeah, Peter, uh, th this is a question not directly uh, in the mainstream of your presentation, uh, which was very clear indeed, but uh, it, it, it was quite intriguing what you have shown in the beginning 
the, the production of heavier particles than initial system, the PP collisions. I, is it well understood? Is it uh, from the uh, produce, production of, of, of neutrons and protons? Probably also heavier particles. Yeah. Uh, we, is yes. it understood from yes, the mold we point of view? So. We believe so, it's understood. Uh, it has to do with the fact that uh, at LAC energy, there is equal number of uh, baryons and antibaryons. And uh, that means uh, if you want to assemble nu light nuclei like deutrons, helium-3, um, alpha particles, uh, you have to assemble them out of the pool of existing nucleons. And if you do that, you pay a penalty for each uh, additional nucleon of about a factor of 300. So in, in other words, uh, between protons and, and deutrons is a factor of 300 and deutrons and helium-3 is a factor of 300 and helium-3 and helium-4 is a factor of 300. And we've actually measured anti-helium-4 and helium-4 and it agrees with that prediction. But if you go down in energy, uh, and I showed you that we could understand it and deutron and anti-deutron to proton ratio already 20 years ago from the HES, it turns out that of course you cannot measure anti-particles anymore because they're gone, but for particles, the same rule applies, but instead of a factor 300, the penalty factor is only 20 and you can go to much higher masses. So in fact, the limit at the moment is something like mass six or mass seven assembled in a nuclear collision like that. Okay, thanks. Thank you. I think we move on uh, to the next talk now. So uh, let me stop sharing. Yeah. So the next talk is by uh, Arno uh, Tripold. Arno was a, a postdoc with Jochen at uh, ECT STAR. Uh, please. Yes, um, thank you. Hello, everyone, and greetings from the University of Graz. Um, thank you also for the introduction and also for the invitation, of course, to speak at this symposium in honor of Jochen Bambach's contributions to science and to ECT STAR. So in this talk, I will focus more on the science that I did together with Jochen Bambach over the last years which was mostly focused on the topic of in medium spectral functions, which we obtained using the non-perturbative functional renormalization group or FRG framework. Um, but before I come to this, um, let me start with a few personal remarks. I first met Jochen Wambach in September, 2011. So almost 10 years ago. Uh, when he was still a professor at the Technical University of Darmstadt and when I was still a diploma student at the University of Graz. At that time, um, I was giving a presentation in Darmstadt in the hopes of being accepted as a PhD student in the group of Jochen Wambach and Lorenz von Smeker. And well, uh, a few months later, I then moved to Darmstadt and started working on my PhD project which was about in medium spectral functions and transport coefficients. After three and a half years, I then did my PhD defense, which was in June 2015, and where Jochen Wambach, of course, was one of my examiners. And you can see some pictures of that day here. Well, about uh, half a year later, Jochen Wambach became the director of ECT STAR. And a few months after that, I was moving to Trento as well to take on my new position as a postdoc at ECT STAR. And you can also see some pictures of that beautiful place here. Um, so for the next two and a half years, I had the opportunity to continue working together with Jochen Wambach at ECT STAR, which was certainly a very productive and enjoyable time. And after this time in Trento, I then moved to Frankfurt and then on to Graz, where I am now, but I always stayed in close contact with Jochen Wambach and continued to collaborate with him. So altogether, it has almost been 10 years of collaboration with Jochen Wambach, which has so far resulted in 14 publications, which you see here with number 15 in preparation. And I of course hope that this collaboration will continue for many years to come in the future. 
Of course, we didn't do all this alone. As you can see, there have been many other people involved, in particular, Lorenz von Smeker, who has been the creative driving force behind most of these publications. So in my talk, I will try to give you an overview of the research that we did together over the last years. And uh, you can see the outline of my talk here. So I will start with an introduction and motivation. Then I will briefly introduce the functional renormalization group or FRG. I will discuss the effective low energy models for QCD that we have been using, and then discuss our analytic continuation procedure which is necessary to obtain real-time quantities like spectral functions from this Euclidean FRG framework. I will then present um, results on the quark spectral function, the scalar and pseudoscalar meson spectral functions, so for the sigma and the pion, and then results on vector and axial vector spectral functions, so for the rho and the A1, as well as on dilepton rates in the end. So uh, let me start with the introduction and motivation. And since the research that I am doing together with Jochen Wambach is focused on investigating the properties of strong interaction matter at finite temperature and density, I want to start here with quantum chromodynamics and its most important features. So here you can see the QCD Lagrangian as part of the standard model of particle physics. Uh, with the gluon field strength tensor, the SU3 structure constants, and the covariant derivative. And although this Lagrangian looks very simple, it encodes all of the interesting effects and features of QCD that we are still trying to understand. One of these features is confinement, which describes the phenomenon that color charged particles cannot be isolated and therefore cannot be directly observed. This is not yet proven analytically, but verified by lattice QCD, where you can see here that the flux tube or string is forming between the two color charged quarks. And when you try to separate these two quarks, the energy stored in this flux tube will eventually be large enough to create new particles, which will lead to string breaking and the formation of new color neutral objects. Another important feature of QCD is asymptotic freedom, which describes the phenomenon that the interaction strength becomes asymptotically weaker as energy increases, which you can also see on this plot here, which summar summarizes recent experimental results on the strong coupling alpha s as a function of momentum exchange q. And uh, theoretically, this effect can be explained by perturbation theory. And you see here the one loop result for alpha s. And you see that the sign of this function depends on the number of flavors and the number of colors. And if you plug in the numbers for QCD, so three colors and six flavors, you see that the sign is positive. So the anti-screening effect dominates over the screening effect and the coupling decreases with higher energies. But the property of QCD that Jochen Wambach and I have focused on in the last years when trying to understand the in medium modifications of particles is chiral symmetry. Chiral symmetry is, as you know, a symmetry of the QCD Lagrangian in the limit of vanishing quark masses. In particular, it is the SU NF left times SU NF right symmetry, where NF is the number of flavors. However, this symmetry is uh, broken spontaneously by the uh, dynamical formation of a quark condensate, um, which reduces the full symmetry to the vector subgroup. So the axial vector part is broken. And in addition, chiral symmetry is, of course, also broken explicitly by the finite quark masses, which you can also see in these diagrams here. So um, the standard interaction term leaves the chirality of the quarks invariant, but the mass term mixes left and right chiral states. And you can also see one of the main consequences chiral symmetry breaking has on the properties of particles, namely on their mass, and in particular on the mass difference of chiral partners. 
So here you see the spectral function of the row vector meson and of the A1 axial vector meson, which I will discuss later in more detail. But you already see here the effect that chiral symmetry restoration has, namely that their mass splitting disappears. So you see these two peaks here approaching each other as temperature increases due to the restoration of chiral symmetry. So you see that uh, chiral symmetry breaking depends on the temperature. And this brings me um, to the chiral and deconfinement phase transitions. So you can see here lattice QCD results on the chiral condensate, which acts as an approximate order parameter for chiral symmetry. And you can see that it decreases with increasing temperature such that chiral symmetry is approximately restored at large temperatures. And uh, on the lower plot, uh, you can see results for the Polyakov loop, which acts as an approximate order parameter for the confinement-deconfinement transition, and which increases with increasing temperature where particles become deconfined. So this uh, brings us to the QCT phase diagram about which we have already heard, which is sketched here and where you can see the different phases of QCD and the phase transitions between them. So you can see the hadron gas regime at low temperatures and small chemical potentials where chiral symmetry is broken and where particles are confined into color neutral objects. And then you see the quark gluon plasma phase at high temperatures and large chemical potentials where chiral symmetry is approximately restored and particles are deconfined. Um, you can also see the chiral phase transition, which separates these two regimes. It is a crossover transition at small chemical potentials and is expected to turn into a critical endpoint and a first order phase transition towards higher chemical potentials and lower temperatures. Um, so the exact nature of this phase diagram is still largely unknown, but there are of course many theoretical as well as experimental efforts underway to get a clearer picture. For example, in terms of heavy ion collision experiments, which you see indicated by these bubbles here, which show you the respective existing and upcoming experiments and the approximate range in the phase diagram where they can be applied. So um, how can heavy ion collisions be used to learn about the phases of QCD and the properties of particles? Well, here you can see the space-time evolution of a central heavy ion collision at relativistic energies. And you see that after the initial collision and the non-equilibrium phase, the system is expected to pass through an equilibrium QGP phase, which is uh, followed by a hot hadron gas phase. And finally, we have the freeze out phase before the produced particles reach the detectors. So in order to learn about the different phases, in particular about the equilibrium QGP phase and the hot hadron gas phase, it turns out that electromagnetic particles like photons and dileptons, which are produced throughout the collision process, are of uh, particular importance since they don't interact strongly with the medium and therefore have a long mean free path and can carry information on the properties of the various phases and of the particles from which they originate to the detector. Um, and from which particles do they originate? Well, at low energies, the virtual photons and dileptons come mostly from the de decay of vector mesons, which is uh, due to the fact that the vector mesons have the same quantum numbers, actual numbers as the photon and can therefore directly decay into dilepton pairs, as you can see here. It then follows that the dilepton rate can be expressed in terms of the spectral functions of the light vector mesons, where the rho vector meson is the most important one. And uh, here you can see results from Ralf Rapp and Hendrik van Hees, which shows that indeed the experimental data, in this case from NA60, can be very well described by using an in medium rho spectral function in combination with a suitable description of the space-time evolution of the collision process. 
So in the following, I will give you an overview of how we can compute such in medium spectral functions in the context of chiral symmetry and how we can use them to calculate dilepton rates and even to identify phase transitions. So this brings me to our theoretical setup. And uh, the first task here will be to find a method then that can be applied in all regimes of the phase diagram, which is already quite non-trivial. So you can see here different available methods and their range of applicability. For example, we have a chiral perturbation theory, which is the low energy effective theory for QCD, and which can be applied at low temperatures and small chemical potentials. Then we have lattice QCD, which is, however, hampered by the fermion sign problem at finite chemical potentials and can only be applied close to the temperature axis. Uh, then there is perturbation theory, which relies on the smallness of the QCD coupling and can be applied at large temperatures and densities. Uh, then we have PCS theory for the color superconducting phases expected at large chemical potentials and low temperatures. And uh, finally, um, nuclear many body theory, which is well suited to describe nuclear matter. So, promising alternatives that can, in principle, apply it in all regimes of the phase diagram are so called functional methods like Dyson Schwinger equations or the functional renormalization group framework. So um, in the following, we are going to use the non-perturbative FRG framework, which can be not can not only be applied um, in all regimes of the phase diagram, but has a number of uh, additional advantages. In particular, it preserves the symmetry structures of uh, and their breaking patterns. It properly deals with phase transitions since it includes both uh, thermal and quantum fluctuations. It allows for a well-defined and straightforward analytic continuation procedure. And it is also thermodynamically consistent in the sense that the spectral properties and the thermodynamical properties are computed on the same footing. So uh, let me summarize the basic idea of the FRG, which is that you start at some high energy or momentum scale with the classical action of the model or effective theory of your choice. For example, with the quark meson model at an energy scale of one GeV. And you then take into account the effects from fluctuations at lower energy scales by solving this so-called flow equation, which you see here, which is also known as the Wetterich equation. And uh, you see this equation is formulated in terms of the effective action gamma, which now depends on the RG scale K and interpolates between the bare action S in the ultraviolet and the full quantum effective action in the infrared. On the right hand side of this flow equation, you can also see the regulator function R, which basically acts as a mass term and suppresses fluctuations with momenta smaller than K. And you can also see that this equation has a very simple diagrammatic representation where the dashed line uh, represents the full scale dependent propagator and the blue circle represents this derivative of the regulator function. So the first model for QCD that we are going to use to calculate in medium spectral functions is the quark meson model. And you can see the corresponding Lagrangian and the effective action here. So the quark meson model is based on chiral symmetry. It describes quarks, pions, and the sigma meson, which interact via a Yukawa coupling term and it contains an effective potential which describes mesonic self-interactions and encodes spontaneous as well as explicit chiral symmetry breaking. So the quark meson model is a low energy effective model for QCD, in this case here for two flavors, and the flow equation for its effective action now contains not only a bosonic loop, but also a fermionic loop from the quarks. And as a first result, I want to show you the flow of the effective potential in the vacuum. And um, I believe I have to switch to window mode. 
Okay, is there a movie coming? So you should see the effective potential, which is symmetric in the ultraviolet. And then as you lower the scale and you take into account fluctuations, you see that chiral symmetry is spontaneously broken. And you see that the minimum of the effective potential moves from zero to some finite value, which tells you that chiral symmetry is broken. And we use the minimum of the potential as the order parameter for chiral symmetry breaking. So if we have this information on the effective potential, um, we can then use it to solve the flow equations for the two-point functions, which you see here. So these equations you can simply derive by taking functional derivatives of the Wetterich equation. And we need this then to arrive at the spectral functions in the end. So the two-point functions are basically the inverse propagators. And you know the spectral function is just the imaginary part of the propagator. So you see, we have here the red triangles, which are the quark meson vertices, which are given by the Yukawa coupling. Um, then we have the blue triangles and blue squares, which are the mesonic vertices, which we simply take from derivatives of this effective potential. And the only thing left to do now is to convert this to equations for real energies. So, so far, uh, this is a Euclidean equation with imaginary energies. And if we want spectral functions, we need to do a analytic continuation procedure to go, go from these Euclidean imaginary energies to real time energies, which we call omega. So this is a two-step procedure. The first step is that we treat the external energy P0 as Euclidean and imaginary and discrete, which uh, simplifies our equations because then we can use periodicities and this external energy drops out in many places, for example, in these occupation numbers. And the final step is then to simply replace the remaining external energies P0, which did not drop out by this continuous real frequency omega in the usual way. And then we have flow equations for the real time two point functions. <clears throat> and uh, then we can simply calculate the spectral function as the imaginary time of the propagator. So with this, I want to come to results. <clears throat> and I want to start with the phase diagram of the quark meson model, which you see here. So you see we have a crossover transition um, over a wide range of the phase diagram, so a chiral crossover. Then we have a critical endpoint and a first order phase transition. And I will basically show you spectral functions along two lines in this phase diagram. So first along the temperature axis and then along this line which will cross the critical endpoint. So here you can see the results on the quark spectral function that um, we obtained. So you see the quark spectral function at finite temperature. On the left, uh, you can see the spectral function as a function of energy omega and spatial momentum p. And you see a quite interesting structure. And in fact, we were able to identify three different in medium excitation branches, which you see on the right figure here. <clears throat> so you see we have the thermal quark in blue, we have the plasmino branch in yellow, and we also have the phonino branch at the very low energies here in this uh, space-like part actually. And all these modes have, of course, also been found using other approaches, for example, beyond HDL calculations. But uh, this is, I guess, the first time that we did it for the FRG in medium based on this uh, quark meson model with chiral symmetry. Let me move on to vector mesons. So, of course, uh, we have already heard that vector mesons have been in the center of Jochen Wambach's research for many years. 
And uh, let me start with a few historical remarks here. So the first model, including vector mesons, was proposed by Sakurai in 1960, where vector mesons were treated as gauge bosons of an SU2 gauge symmetry. Um, then the electromagnetic hadronic interaction was mediated exclusively by the exchange of vector mesons, as you can also see here. Um, we had the current field identity, so the electromagnetic current was um, expressed in terms of the vector meson fields, the rho, the omega, and the phi. And this was then also known as the vector meson dominance model. It was uh, later extended by Li and Ni in the 1960s, who not only treated the rho meson, but also its chiral partner, the A1 meson, as gauge bosons of this SU2 left times SU2 right symmetry. And this is basically what we did a few years ago. So we used a gauged linear sigma model with quarks. So we introduced rho and A1 mesons as, uh, so to say, gauge bosons of an SU2 left times SU2 right symmetry. We also introduced the photon field. And then we arrived at this um, Lagrangian or effective action, which I will, of course, not discuss into in, in detail here. But you see, it's uh, based again on the quark meson model with the introduction of these rho and A1 mesons and also of the photon field. So we then calculated spectral functions for the vector and axial vector mesons. Um, so we first derived flow equations again for the two-point functions. We analytically continued these flow equations to real energies and then solved them numerically. And we arrived at these results here. So you see the rho spectral function in blue and the A1 spectral function in purple at different temperatures and vanishing chemical potential. So we have here results for 10 MeV, 100 MeV, 150 MeV, and 300 MeV. And uh, you see how these uh, spectral func functions change with increasing temperature. And you in particular see that they become degenerate as expected due to the restoration of chiral symmetry at very high temperatures. Um, we then also had a closer look at the pole masses of these particles. So the pole masses are basically given by the location of the peaks of the spectral functions. And you see the main effect with increasing temperature is that the A1 pole mass drops down to the rho pole mass. This is, you also see summarized on this plot here. So you see the behavior of the pole masses as a function of temperature. And you see the main effect is that the A1 mass drops down to the rho mass, which is consistent with this uh, broadening melting rho scenario, which has been around in the literature for many years. Yeah, um, in the final part of my talk, I want to come to the electromagnetic spectral function and to dilepton rates in order to um, so in order to calculate dilepton rates, um, we need this electromagnetic spectral function, which is basically um, given by the photon-photon correlation function. So what we did, we derived flow equations for the two-point functions of the rho, the photon, and the mixing part of rho and photon. As I mentioned, the rho and the photon have the same quantum number, so they can mix. And uh, so we have to diagonalize this matrix of two-point functions to arrive at the physical photon-photon um, two-point function. And this is then the electromagnetic spectral function. And if we have this, we can insert it uh, into, for example, the Weldon formula for the thermal dilepton rate, which you see here. And we did this in a certain um, approximation. So we took the dilepton mass to be zero, and we set the external spatial momentum to zero such that the transverse and longitudinal electromagnetic spectral functions are the same. 
and with this with these simplifications we then arrived at these first results on the electromagnetic spectral function and on dilepton rates so in the top plot uh, you have results for the rho spectral function in blue the bare photon in red or purple and the full diagonalized photon which is the electromagnetic spectral function in yellow and if we plug this then into the Weldon formula we get these results for the dilepton rates where you actually see ratios of different dilepton yields um, close to the critical endpoint. So we have here uh, chemical potentials at low temperatures close to the critical endpoint. And you see that um, very close to the critical endpoint. So at 298 MeV in this um, calculation, the green line, you see a strong enhancement of the dilepton yield, which could point um, also to an experimental signature to observe the critical endpoint in heavy ion collisions. Um, and on my final slide, I wanted to show you some very recent results from upcoming work, which will hopefully be on the archive in a few weeks. So we are currently working on calculating vector and axial vector meson spectral functions in nuclear matter. For this, we use the parity doublet model, which describes um, the nuclear liquid gas phase transition, as well as the chiral phase transition, which you also see in this phase diagram on the right. And in this regime, we then calculate the rho spectral function, which you see in blue here, and the A1 spectral function in yellow. And you see these uh, very interesting in medium modifications, which appear here close to the critical endpoint. So with this, um, I want to come to my summary and the outlook. So I hope I could convince you that the functional renormalization group is a powerful non-perturbative framework to study the properties of strong interaction matter at finer temperature and chemical potential. And we have discussed these analytically continued flow equations, which allow for the calculation of in medium spectral functions, as well as transport coefficients in the context of chiral symmetry restoration. And as an outlook, I would like to say that uh, we are now working also on including a fluctuating omega meson to improve the thermodynamical description of nuclear matter. We are working on improving the description of vector and axial vector meson spectral functions in nuclear matter in the context of chiral symmetry breaking. And we want to calculate realistic dilepton rates and identify signatures for phase transitions. And uh, with this, I would like to thank Jochen Wambach for many years of support, education and collaboration. And I hope that this will continue for many years in the future. So thank you very much. Thank you, Arno, for this nice uh, overview. Are there any questions? Uh, Michael. Yeah, thank you. Uh, very nice talk. I have one question uh, concerning the um, rho and A1 spectral functions. Uh, so uh, the quark meson model is of course not confining. And I, as far as I remember from, from earlier calculations, you, you had the problem once that uh, uh, the rho and in particular the A1 could decay also at low temperatures into quarks. So what, what did you do about this? Because now this looks very nice, everything. Well, these, these plots indeed are nice, but you are right, there is still this quark antiquark decay in it. But um, what we did about it, we switched to a model that does not have quarks, but uh, nucleons. So now in this new calculation, which will be on the archive in a few weeks, we don't have quark decays anymore because it's a purely hadronic model. And there we just have the physical decays into nucleons and other particles. Okay, then of course at high temperatures, this would maybe not be... That's true, but this is not in the focus of this work. Okay, thank you. Other questions? 
Um, I had a question about the uh, dileptron rate. Uh, you can show this slide again. This one, yeah. So there is a Hartum loop calculation of the dileptron rate, I think by Braten and Thomas or so. Uh, so have you compared it with that calculation? I think we did some example calculations, yes, but as far as I remember, this is for a quark medium, right? For a quark medium, yeah. Right. Ah, that's right. Sorry, this is non-zero mu. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So you wouldn't be able to compare, yeah. Yeah, but so as far as this is concerned, this this works. This compares well, yeah. Yeah. So when you can compare. Yeah. So, other questions. Other questions. Okay. If not, then miraculously we're back on the schedule. So we now have a break of uh, ten minutes, and then we meet to listen to uh, Guy Moore. So have a drink, stretch your legs, take the dogs out, see you in 10 minutes. Guy, you are a co-host, so you should be able to share without any problems. And we continue with, uh, with Guy Moore on uh, photons for Jochen. Okay, so... I wanted to, so I, I thought about what I should talk about, and I realized that the biggest overlap between things that I've worked on and things that Jochen has worked on are uh, photons and, in general, electromagnetic poles. So I thought I would refresh Jochen with the things that we've done on those issues, always with a little bit of thinking about how it connects with the type of physics that Jochen has worked on. And so I'm going to give sort of a, a fun review of Jochen, photons, and me, and then talk about the big picture of photons, how the photons, I the, the QCD regime that I consider is different than Jochen, and the story of the photons at high temperature. Uh, I want to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to talk about this, uh, especially for the occasion. And I thought I'd start out with just a funny little story about meeting Jochen. Um, so here's this picture of Jochen that I like very much because he still uses it as when, when he's on Zoom meetings and he switches off his camera. This is a photo that pops up. And it always makes me giggle a little bit because Jochen hasn't looked like that for a while. And so I put it next to a photo Photograph of me, which is maybe a little bit closer. It was taken a few years ago, but I have to admit that when I look at it, I am a little more gray than I was then, especially on the sides. Um, and I have a picture of Tatiana because it's part of the funny story. So I met Jochen when I was interviewing for the position at the Tate of Darmstadt in 2015. And it was one of those things where you meet somebody and you have a feeling that you've actually already always known them. We just immediately got along with him. Uh, you could joke around with him. You, I just had this feeling like he was somebody familiar to me. And a few months later was the first time that the, I was ever you know, talking to Jochen at the same time that Tatiana was there. And afterwards, she remarked to me, I thought, you know, I know that you're new here in Darmstadt, but I, I hadn't known that you'd known Jochen for so long because her impression from the way that we chatted with each other was that we were old friends. And in a way we were, even though we only met a couple of months earlier. So I just thought that was sort of a funny story. And I told her, no, I actually only met her, met him uh, two months ago and she was kind of shocked. So that's, that's my funny story about meeting Jochen. Um, what I have in common with Jochen, well, I think I have a lot in common with Jochen. We have, uh, common curiosities and interests, but in particular, scientifically, we're both interested in electromagnetic poles of heavy ion collisions. And the big differences between our interests here are in the energy scales and the techniques which we apply. Where Jochen's expertise is at lower temperatures, higher chemical potentials, uh, where you have to think about hadrons. And I'm too stupid to understand hadrons very well. And so I concentrate on a regime where 
one should be discussing quarks and gluons, such as where I feel more comfortable. So my expertise is at higher temperatures and energies. And so I'm going to review photon production. And um, I'm going to start out by explaining why anyone would want to do that. So we collide these, and everyone knows this already, but I'm just going to review it anyway to set the right background for the rest of the talk. So we collide these heavy ions, and at every stage of the rest of the collision, photons and dilepton pairs are getting produced. So there's production very early on when the um, when the primary partons of the two nuclei are originally colliding. And then when the leftover rescattered partons, which are still swimming around in here, are colliding in the form of a quark gluon plasma, then they continue to emit photons. Photons come out after those things are stuck together at the hadrons, but while they're still interacting. And then finally, as they're flying apart, there are hadrons which decay producing photons. And the thing that makes photons uh, unique, well, okay, not a unique, but a very interesting um, probe of what's going on in these heavy ion collisions, is that these photons produced at these very early stages make it out. Interactions between uh, quarks and gluons or hadrons or whatever stuff, the soup that's making up this plasma, um, have such strong interactions that they don't make it out at this time. And they only escape here at some late phase when the interaction between, when the mesons are so far apart that they can fly away without any further interaction. Uh, and so the photons are giving us information about all the stages of the reaction, whereas the information about the early stages in the reaction only come out from the hadrons in an indirect form. That's why they're interesting. And essentially the reason for this is because of the small size of the electromagnetic interaction. And uh, that means that thermal photons and particularly di leptons may rep represent a good opportunity of essentially sticking a thermometer into the PPP and finding out what temperatures are there. And so we should try to understand their production. So let's think about how photons get made. Uh, because the electromagnetic coupling is small, we are free to expand to lowest order in the electromagnetic coupling. And uh, that means essentially we're going to calculate how likely you are to make one photon. And then we're going to exponentiate that as a Poissonian process to figure out the total photon production. And to make one photon, the rate of producing a photon at a particular free momentum is set by the trace on your density matrix of how likely the density matrix is to evolve in time into a state which contains a photon in the final state. This is the time evolution operator. And this is any arbitrary state of the strong interaction stuff plus a photon. And in order to get a photon, you have to have an electromagnetic interaction show up. So within the interaction picture, you need a current operator, both in the forward and the backward time evolution, which corresponds to creating the photon in the amplitude and the conjugate amplitude. And they have to um, create a photon with a correct wave number, which means that you need to do a Fourier transform and search out the guys which have the appropriate uh, wave number. And this corresponds to a current current correlator at a particular k vector integrated over your location in the medium. And us formal guys refer to this correlation function. Oh, and by the way, the specifics of the final state cancel out because the sum over all possible such final states, and that's an identity. And so uh, the current current correlator in, in the medium, and in particular, this correlator where the currents are ordered as shown, the Whiteman correlator, is the relevant quantity for understanding production. 
and almost, so let's say, no injurious assumptions have been made in going through this, except that how in the world are you supposed to calculate this thing? And here I make an approximation, which is I hope that the uh, material in the heavy ion collision is at least fairly close to locally. Thermal. I also make an approximation that I'm only going to talk about photons of a sufficient high energy that their wavelength is very short compared to the whole size of the system. The ones which have very long wavelengths are also interesting because through the um, through the um, oh, now I'll forget the name. They carry information about um, the total size of the system. Um, but I won't talk about them. I'll talk about the ones which have such high energies that you can think of them as being produced locally at some location. And then you can hope that the system is locally close to equilibrium and try to understand the production of photons from an equilibrated uh, QCD system. And in that case, the correlation function we want is a function only of the temperature, the local flow velocity at the point of interest. And you can use thermal field theory relations to relate it to the spectral function that we heard about in the previous lecture um, or the retarded function. So what we want to know is the spectral function of electromagnetic waves. And um, if the energy equals the momentum that is telling you about the production of real photons. And if the energy exceeds the momentum, it's also physically useful because it's telling you about the production of dielectrons, which are um, produced in smaller numbers, but have a much smaller background. And so they're also very interesting. Now, these spectral functions depend a lot on the energy. And we were hearing about some of the spectral functions in the previous lecture. And the way I think about it is that there's the Johann's world at relatively low temperatures and high chemical potentials. And there's my world where you're in a system that's made up mostly of quartz and fluids. And in these two sides of things, they look rather different. different. And in particular, in uh, lower energies, you have to worry about resonances you have peaks in the spectral functions arising from things like rho mesons. And you ask, does the rho meson shift in its energy or does it get broader? Or how is it being changed by the presence of a medium? And uh, when you go up in energy, there aren't any mesons left. They've all been blown apart. And you're really looking at the quartz and the quartz with which they were constituted. And so for me, there's a region here, which uh, is not directly explorable experimentally, where the most important physics is quark in, quark out, photon. There's a region in here for dielectrons where the uh, photon is either producing or being emitted from a quark and a quark pair. So this is annihilation of a quark and a quark into a photon. And there's a region in the middle where neither this kinematics nor this kinematics is allowed. And it has to be something more complicated with some kind of an additional scattering partner. Uh, and this is the case for real photons. Something similar goes on over here, but because it's complicated by the presence of things like uh, resonances and mesons and things. And, uh, this is the world that Johan tries to understand. And I'm going to focus on this one because it's the one I can actually tell you something useful about. So in Guy's world, the very lowest order in perturbation theory is that a current is decoupling to parts. And so your photon has to attach to some parts. And the simplest thing that could happen is that that's the whole story. Photon attaches to on shell quark and attic quark. And then you're squaring that amplitude. So if you want to think about it this way, you cut this diagram, and here's an amplitude, and here's a conjugate amplitude, and you're squaring it to find a really producing photon. And in the uh, 
space-like region, you're doing these inelastic scattering. And in the time-like region, you're doing perannihilation. And at the very, very lowest order, there's actually a notch feature here where the spectral function goes to zero. And sadly, this is exactly the point that you need to understand for photon production. And so the lowest order description just doesn't describe the um, So what do we do? Well, you go further to higher order diagrams. Here are some diagrams. If I cut this, I get this process. Uh, same here, and if I cut this, then I get an interference between, uh, let's see. Yes, between this process and this process. And so, and this corresponds to the square of that process, this corresponds to the square of that process, and this is the interference. So the diagrams add up to the physical processes which can produce photons. And there's two important regimes. There's a regime of this process where um, you can think of this quark as coming in and it gets turned into a photon by the exchange of a virtual quark that turns a gluon into a quark. And there's another process. Let's see, that's the extreme of this process as you go to small exchange here. And a large exchange is just an ordinary scatter. But there are, so, so these are the processes you need to calculate. And then the trouble is that this is a massless quark propagating across the middle and the uh, matrix element has a U over T or an S over T. And uh, that diverges at a small transfer moment. And you need to think harder about what's going on here and include thermal corrections that happen on soft lines. And that's called the hard W. But that's not the whole story because at leading order, you also need to think about a process which looks like this in which a photon emission is induced by an elastic scattering off of another constituent in the medium. And it looks like this should be higher order because it has two QCD vertices instead of only one QCD vertex. But it turns out that's not true because of the kinematics of this pair. If the opening angle here is very, very small, and this thing is very, very close to on shell until it scatters, or if the scattering happened earlier, sorry, then it was very, very close to on shell here. And then you have some very close to on shell enhancement, which makes this just as important. But the physics of something being very, very close to on shell is the statement that it can propagate a long distance before it realizes it has the wrong condition. And in fact, in this case, a long enough distance that it can undergo additional scatterings. And that means that a process here where you emit a photon and then scatter several times, and a process where you do all the scattering first and then emit the photon, actually interfere with each other. And you have to resum them if you want to get a complete description of the photon production. And um, this resummation has to go on top of the complexities of thermal vehicles. And that's things like the fact that the thermal bath is breaking or insulated. Normally, we think of gluons as being massless until you get down to the confinement scale, where something complex and non perturbative goes on. But if you look at things at very high energies at very short scales, the gluon is massless, and that's just a combination of gauge invariance and Lorentz invariance. But if you have a thermal bath, there went Lorentz symmetry. And so this argument isn't actually valid anymore. And effectively, the gluon is massive 
in the thermal medium. The, the mass rises as you increase the temperature. And so this is not at the confinement scale in a hot medium, it's, it's a, a much higher energy scale. And this effect only goes away when you consider sufficiently long wavelength and transverse photon, uh, gluons, and then it turns out this one still on axis. And so the other problem is that this is uh, energy and direction and polarization dependent. And um, the loop expansion doesn't work the way that you used to. You usually say that for every loop, you get a factor of G squared, and that suppresses it by a power of the couple. But in a thermal situation, every loop brings a factor of G squared and also a statistical function. And in the low energies, the statistical function can be large. And you think, who cares? Because I'm interested in producing high energy photons. But just because this is high energy doesn't mean this is high energy. The scattering can be at low energy, and the photon is at a high energy. And um, actually, this scattering being at low energy is part of what makes it so easy for the immediate state to be almost on shell. And so that's the key region. And now I learned that in that key region, the um, perturbative expansion is not an expansion in G squared. But it's enhanced by these both the statistical factors, which can make the convergence of the conservative series very poor. And that means that when this scale is involved in your uh, scattering process, which it is, then the corrections are of order G and not of order G squared. And at some scale, the perturbation theory breaks down completely. But that's first relevant at, and next to next to leading order. So we won't worry about it. Now, you could say, well, leaning order was really hard. It took us a few years to do it. It took the community, I guess, 10 years to do it. Uh, why isn't that enough? We don't compute so many things beyond leaning order in thermal theory. And the answer is that if you want to know whether the leaning order calculation is any good, you really have to go to next to leaning order. And there's reasons to worry that it won't be good. Because as I just described, if I have uh, soft physics, then the addition of a loop because of the stimulation factor is only suppressed by G. And sometimes when you do a perturbative calculation, G is really G over G pi. And then everything is good because even at pretty strong couplings, this is a factor of maybe a quarter. And then you're 30% accurate is pretty good for a perturbative calculation in PCB. But if this two pi isn't there, and you only really find out by trying a calculation and doing it next to the order, then you could be in trouble because the coupling itself is over two. And then the perturbative series is just hopeless. So you need an next leading order result to find out about the convergence of the series. And here's why it's hard. Think about doing this diagram. You need that at next to leading order. And you have everything. You have multiple particles involved. You have non-abelian vertices. And this even interferes, this is in an amplitude and it interferes with the one where the scatterings are separate and it interferes with the one where the scatterings are in one order and where they're in the other order and where they come before the photon and where they come after the photon and all of this. So this looks um, challenging. But it's still possible, and it's possible because of a nice and using piece of physics. So foolishly, the first thing we tried to calculate beyond the order was uh, the behavior of a heavy quark. And that was a night. And the reason is that the heavy quark is steaming along at some small velocity, which means that in a space-time diagram, this position is time. It's going mostly in the time direction. And that means that it can interact, it can emit quanta into the medium. They go out and they bounce into something else and they come back. And essentially the um, heavy quark is feeling the, its own, the effects on the medium of its own presence. And so this thing is constantly sort of sitting in its own you know, um, puddle of sweat 
and feeling the effects of things that it's done in the past, and that all has to be taken into account. But if you're moving at the speed of light and you emit something at any angle other than perfectly collinear, then for that to get back to you, it would have to move faster than the speed of light, which is impossible. And so the only way that something moving at the speed of light can inter interact with its medium is that something happens in the medium and that sends information to your particle at more than one place. But that has nothing to do with the particle itself. That just is properties of the medium. So you're only learning about correlations which were already there in the medium. You're not learning about the medium interacting with your particle, interacting with the medium, interacting back with your particle. It's just your particle interacting with multiple things already present in the medium. And that's physically simple. And this simplification has to show up somewhere in the, uh, the calculation. So then a miracle occurs and the simpl simplification makes it all super easy. Um, so we need to be a little bit more explicit in this step. So what happens is that the main physics is that I have a quark and it splits into a quark and a photon. And these are going in almost exactly the same direction. And then as it's going, it's having all of these weak, weeny little interactions with this medium. So the main physics is happening along this axis and involves things which are moving, as I said. In a light like fashion. And what that means, because this thing, the initial quark, the photon, and the final quark are all almost collinear with each other. That the fact, the requirement that this be on shell, this be on shell, this be on shell, is a requirement that the transfer momentum. The stuff you have to kick in and out to make this process happen it has to keep the final state on shell, which means that it has to have an equal, it has to fact, uh, feature an equal amount. So in all of these other guys coming in, the Z component of the momentum has to equal the energy that's being brought out. That's a condition to make sure that these guys can both be on shell. And that means in terms of this exchange momentum, the Z momentum and the energy are the same. This doesn't look like much of a simplification until you write it in light tone coordinates in terms of the plus and minus variables, which are roughly speaking the P0 minus PZ and the P0 plus PZ variables. And in terms of those variables, this eliminates one of them and leaves the other. But the variable it's leaving here, oh, I wrote them backwards. These are switched, sorry. The variable it's leaving here is a null variable. And um, the analyticity properties of correlation functions are that you can continue them into the upper half plane if they're either time-like or null. So this is something we do all the time with retarded functions. And usually we think that that's true of the energy variable, but it's also true of a light cone variable. And that means that our matrix element expressed in terms of the light cone variables, you don't have to evaluate it at the actual momentum which are happening. You can evaluate it at some imaginary momentum where this becomes large. And in fact, the functional form of this thing becomes extremely simple. All the thermal effects become very, very simple in that regime. And this means that you're taking advantage of some simplicity in the form of these kinds of medium, pre existing medium correlations, sort of the physical origin of the simplification. So I push my contour out deep into the complex plane where my matrix elements and so on all have a much, much functionally simpler behavior. And now I can do the calculation. And we find two significant corrections compared to the leading order behavior. This is at a realistic coupling of alpha strong of 0.3. This is at some fabulously high temperature, which will never be achieved. I suppose it happened early in the universe. 
And the red curve is the leading order calculation. And there's a correction that puts it up here. There's another correction which puts it down there. And when you take both of them into account, then you get to this green curve, which happens to be practically the same as the red curve. And so the uh, thermal effects are actually really small. If they're small, I mean, it's a little bit suspicious. There's two different kinds of 50% corrections, but with opposite signs, so they cancel. And the final effect is quite small. That doesn't mean that the perturbation theory is beautifully under control because there's only 10% corrections. The fact that that 10% was sort of 50% minus 40%, implies to me that the corrections are not super well under control. But I mean, they're not crazy. It's not behaving like deep in the uh, oscillating part of an asymptotic series. And so we think actually that we have a fairly good control over the photon uh, emission rate in uh, down to temperatures of maybe one and a half or two times DC. And as an aside, some other people calculated the uh, photon emission rate in a unrelated, well, no, a kind of similar theory where there are very strong techniques for handling the strong coupling regime. And that's n equals four super young nilsa. This is QCD, but with the wrong number of quarks, the wrong representation of quarks, and some scalars thrown. And I can stick electromagnetism into this theory and ask how many photons get produced from a quark gluon plasma of this n equals four quark gluon plasma. Since it's not the same theory as QZD, I have to decide how I'm going to compare that to the behavior in QZD. And I'm going to compare it by relate by taking a ratio of photon production to electric susceptibility. And when I do that, I find that as a function of the photon energy, in the for low energy photons, which are experimentally difficult to deal with, strong uh, interacting super young nilsa produces fewer. At high energies, it produces more, but not by a huge factor. This is one, this is 1.2 something. And so, actually, the production of photons from a quark gluon plasma is almost as fast as it would be if it were in a genuinely strong coupled regime, uh, which is just sort of a, a funny aside. So in conclusion, the photon rate is physically interesting and its computation involves current current correlation factors, um, which require some tricky resummations if you want to do them with perturbative calculations, uh, which turn out to be possible to NLO due to some rather beautiful analogicity properties. So Guy and Jochen are different, but we have some things in common. Um, and Jochen, I hope that the piece that caught at least a little bit of your fancy. Uh, thank you. Thanks, thank Guy. You. So this is, is due to some not due to the fact that there are different type of particles in. That's been taken out by the normalization of the susceptibility, say. I mean, the fact that it's, is it completely flat here? Is it just... Um... Is it completely, uh, that's a good question. I think if you go very far, that it's not completely flat. I think, I mean, I think that one of them has something like a half power and the other one has something like a one third. So I think that there's something like a one sixth power difference. I see. If I, if I redrew this going out to hundreds, then I think that they would actually. I see. Okay. Um, other questions? And no, so thanks, Guy. So we'll go to the next talk. So, Tatjana is the next speaker. So, Tatjana Kalachuk will talk about extreme and shining. Yeah, thanks a lot, Gert, and to also to all the organizers for the opportunity to speak here in honor of Jochen. And many things have been said, and also people remember when they met Jochen for the first time. I usually remember things quite well, but I really could not find the 
starting point when I met Jochen for the first time, because I just have a feeling, and I think that's really like this, Jochen, you have been there all the time since I came to Germany, and we have been discussing physics in various uh, occasions at different places. And I am also not worried so much. I do not remember when our lifetime in the scientific life have started. So they were also mentioning about the common publication and people list the common publications. If I think about our common list of publications, it is extreme, but it's also strallant. We do have a common publication in the Physik Journal and at this moment, thanks to Achim Richter, who really initiated this uh, process. And uh, we have enjoyed a lot over the uh, couple of months or even almost a year to discuss the physics about uh, physics of electromagnetic radiation. And this is also the focus of my uh, talk to you today, uh, Jochen, about uh, electromagnetic radiation from extreme states of, of QCD matter. And also a lot has been said already by previous speakers. Let me also start from saying that all what we do in the field of the heavy ion re uh, reactions is related to the uh, understanding of the QCD phenomena, which led to the creation of the universe as we know it today. And our knowledge about the QCD phase uh, structure, we usually summarize on the QCD phase diagram shown as a function of temperature and baryon chemical potentials. And indeed, we do have an extremely good guidance from the first principle calculations when we speak about the vanishing chemical potentials but high temperatures. However, towards the high and higher baryon chemical potentials, lattice QCD suffers from the notorious sign problem. And uh, on the other hand, we have many lattice QCD guided uh, effective models. And these models do predict quite rich structure in the region of the high baryon chemical potentials. Namely, the first order deconfinement and chiral phase transition is predicted. And it is also clear that if we have crossover on one side and first order phase transition on the other side, they will meet in the second order critical endpoint. And of course, there are also uh, a lot of exotic phases uh, predicted to exist in the region of high baryon chemical potential. So all in all, there is quite a large discovery potential. And this is the place also where um, a lot of experimental efforts also went over the last years. And uh, from the experimental side, we try to measure with really high precision different regions on this QCD phase diagram. And our goal is to locate the onset of QGP to find out and clarify the existence of the critical point. And of course, we also would like to understand the microscopic properties of the matter at different temperatures and different chemical potentials. To do that, as also discussed by, by Peter uh, in more details, we can use different observables like um, light particle productions and strangeness to learn about the chemistry of the fireball. We can use also charm, which is the best observable to learn about the transport properties of the medium. Event by event uh, correlations and fluctuations of conserved quantum numbers in the limited volume can also tell us about the criticality. And last but not least, tie leptons, they can tell us about emissivity of matter. And this is where I will focus today. Indeed, a phase diagram of QCD matter, also we know quite a bit from the fit of statistical hadronization model to the particle yields, hadron yields, as they are measured, so-called chemical freeze out. We do not know yet much about entire QCD phase diagram by means of the dileptons. And this is already here indicated 
by the fact that only two red dots are shown on this phase diagram, which are the measurements of the dileptons at SPS and also at SAS 18 beam energy. And indeed, dileptons, they do play a unique role in exploration of different phases on the QCD phase diagram. Why it's like this? Guy nicely introduced that photons, real but also virtual photons, they are radiated through the entire lifetime of the hot and dense uh, matter. Uh, they do not suffer from the strong interaction, therefore they leave reaction volume being undistorted, and therefore they can really encode and bring to the experimental setups that measure photons and dileptons important information about the spectral properties of the matter, but also about um, macroscopic characterization of the fireball, like, for example, temperature or uh, lifetime of the system from which these photons, real or virtual, were radiated. And indeed, long time ago, Semyon Tin said, if you want to detect something new, build a dilepton spectrometer. And there were many um, experiments that try to look at the radiation of photons and virtual and also real photons. And here I try to sketch them in the phase diagram, again, as a function of temperature baryon chemical potential. Here we do have Alice at uh, finite baryon chemical potential, vanishing baryon chemical potential. Uh, Phoenix experiment that also studied dielectron production at rig energies. Star measure dileptons at top rig energies, but also in the uh, so called beam energy scan. An A60 and Ceres experiment also took the challenge to look at the di muons and dielectrons at the SPS energy regime. On the other side, uh, the exploration of the matter really at the highest net baryon densities is being done by the Hades experiment at CIS-18. And as you can see already from this uh, sketch, there is quite a gap between the SPS measurements and SIS energy. And this is exactly in the regime where phenomena like the first order phase transition or QCD critical endpoint is being predicted by the theory. Therefore, exploration of this region by the experiments would be absolutely essential. How do we do this with the dileptons? We measure so-called invariant mass distribution of electrons and positrons. And of course, uh, there are many sources which contributes to such dilepton uh, invariant mass spectra. And here I listed them. So we have in our spectra contribution from the Drelian shown with the green color. Uh, also from the short-lived states, different baryonic resonances, or in the case of lower energies, we have E plus E minus contribution from the nucleon nucleon or pion nucleon bremsstrahlung. Then what is shown in the red color here in this figure, that so-called thermal radiation that originates from either quark-gluon plasma phase or from the hadronic phase, but hadronic phase in this sense, hot and dense. And uh, this is then lead to the strong modification of the particles at the higher temperature and higher densities. And last but not least, we do have a contribution to the dilepton spectra from the hadronic states like by zero, eta, omega, phi, uh, that uh, do decay at the freeze out. And these particles, they are the main and dominant source of the so-called combinatorial backgrounds that we have to deal experimentally before we really can uh, come up with the measurement of the thermal radiation. So I will use in my presentation expression excess yield. And this excess yield we define experimentally as the dilepton yield which is left after the subtraction of ideally measured uh, decay to the cocktail, which is originating from this stage, early stage like I and uh, also later freeze out stages 
from the pyrum eta and so on and our main goal in experiment is to extract so-called thermal radiation and either thermal radiation or excess yield will be then used to discuss the physics um, how to calculate dilepton production from the matter in thermal equilibrium so the general framework is like that one starts from the electromagnetic current current correlation function imaginary part of which is uh, named photon or dilepton self energy and this um, spectral function directly defines the production rate of the real photons or, or dileptons and here I also show you both for the reason that I would like to emphasize both are extremely good probes of the hot and dense fireballs however dileptons carry unique information in terms of their invariant mass and therefore by measuring dilepton spectra in the experiment one could really get a direct information about the in medium spectral function that has been also introduced by previous speakers um, this uh, electromagnetic uh, spectral function is well known in the vacuum Um, from the electron positron annihilation through the ratio of E plus E minus going to hadron divided by cross section of E plus E minus going to mu plus mu minus. And uh, we usually divide, divide this um, spectra in the different regions. So called low mass region is uh, saturated by the light vector mesons like rho, omega, and phi, giving the rise to vector dominance model. And this, as we know, due to the fact that the parity and spin of the photon and also vector mesons are identical, one minus. Therefore, we do see this uh, nice resonances in the low mass range. Rho meson plays a specific role because it is by factor of approximately 10 overshine the omega and phi. And in addition, the lifetime of the rho meson is almost factor of 10 uh, smaller than the lifetime of the hot and dense system created in the heavy ion reaction. Therefore, rho meson is often the uh, matter of being regenerated in this hot and dense fireballs and uh, therefore uh, plays a major role if we speak of the vector mesons with respect of the phi and omega. In the intermediate mass range, Okay, something is not really working in the right, okay. In the intermediate mass range, we do not have uh, such a resonances. This ratio is uh, flat and it also uh, points to the fact that in this mass range, we do have a um, perturbative QCD at work where the electron and positron goes via hadronization of the quark, anti-quark pairs. But of course, our aim to learn about the spectral function in the medium, and not only that, we also try to connect the spectral function to the uh, QCD properties like chiral symmetry. Nicely introduced by Arno, just a recall, the chiral symmetry is spontaneously broken in the vacuum because of the non-vanishing value of the quark-anti-quark -quark pair. And, uh, this all uh, leads to the fact that there is the mass splitting between the vector and axial vector particles as shown here in this beautiful calculation using QCD and chiral sum rules. But we also know that uh, chiral symmetry can, can be restored if temperature and density changes. And this restoration of chiral symmetry manifests itself in the fact that the vector and axial vector particles are being mixed. And if the temperature high enough, there is the clear degeneracy between the vector and axial vector particles, uh, meaning, and uh, here are the words from, from the author of the paper, Ralf Rapp, also present in the audience today, the chiral mass splitting between the rho particle and A1, in this case, is burns off. And what we also see, the resonance itself 
being melted, but without the mass shift towards the lower masses. In addition, this type of the spectral functions, one can nicely connect to the expectation value of the chiral condensate by looking the moments of the differences between the vector and axial vector spectral function. And Arno nicely showed us that indeed, if you also use the functional renormalization group, you see the very similar effects. In the vacuum, there is the clear mass split between the vector and axial vector particles, which disappears as a function of temperature. And this goes line in line with the depletion of the chiral condensate, which I showed you on top there. So the text of the song is, Rho meson melts, A1 mass decreases, and if the temperature high enough, vector and axial vector particle degenerates such uh, uh, near the ground state, which is the mass of the rho in this case. Now, the question is what happens to the nucleons because they are nucleons and resonances because they are also important in the physics we, of the dileptons. And here I brought you the calculation from the lattice Kutze D that also shows that when the temperature of the medium is high enough, so here we speak about baryon chemical potential being zero, there is the emergency uh, of the parity doubling. And uh, here one could also see, for example, for the nucleon and uh, chiral partner of the nucleon, which is N star 1535, the behavior as a function of temperature. So this brownish uh, dots, uh, that's uh, how the nucleon and its chiral partner look like in the vacuum. But uh, it, uh, the, the situation is also like that, that if the temperature increases, then nucleon seems to stay as it is, as its chiral partner uh, changing its mass towards the ground state, which is also indicated with this black curve, uh, identical from the left to the right plot. And here the song is that the mass of the nucleon is found to be independent on the hadronic medium. And as I also said, that uh, uh, just the same as for the mesons, baryons also do uh, act like this, that the chiral partner of the nucleon changes its mass towards the ground state, which is the mass of the nucleon. But what happened if the temperature of the medium is increased further or if the density of the medium gets even uh, more dense? So at some moment when the temperature is high enough, uh, mesons are melt even further such that at the temperatures, here as an example of 180 MeV, one basically do not see any structure on the dilepton rates calculated for the raw meson. And at some moment, spectral function merges in the QC, QGP description, indicating that we do have a change of the degrees of freedom. And uh, such measurement would be extremely beautiful. And we look forward to the results from the RIC and also LHC. But success story with respect of the in-medium spectral function comes from the hadronic many body theory. What we know from authors of the paper, Ralph and uh, Jochen, raw meson in the medium interacts with hadrons, with uh, mesons, but also with the baryons. And therefore, the self energy of the raw meson is being strongly modified because of the in medium pion cloud or due to the direct coupling of the raw to the baryons. Here as an example, I show you in medium spectral function of the raw meson at different temperatures and also different baryon uh, densities. And one can see also here that baryons do play an important role in the modification of the spectral function shown in this, with this red line over here. So rho peak uh, undergoes strong broadening and baryons do play an important role. And this type of the spectral function is famous as the rap wambach spectral function. And I will tell further how well does this work with the experimental data. 
And I start with dileptons as spectrometer, showing you results of this model calculation together with the data measured at SPS energies. On the left hand side, dilepton measurements from Ceres collaboration. On the right, muon measurements from the NA60 collaboration. With the two scenarios uh, from the Rap Wambach spectral function, on the right uh, figure, you see the magenta curve, which includes the full calculation, and the red curve indicates what happens to this calculation if one excludes the interaction of the row with the baryons. And this, of course, clearly visible for both cases that without baryons, one has a hard time to explain the dilepton yield in the low masses for both measurements. What happens if we move on with the collision energy where the net baryon densities is getting smaller? Um, here I brought you results from the STAR collaboration and the beam energy scan. Here just an example for three energies, but in general measurements from 200 GeV down to 19.6 GeV in the center of mass energy exists. Also Phoenix measurement and uh, measurement from Alice. And as one can see, rap wambach spectral function works extremely well from the LHC energies down to the SPS energies and also lowest one measured by the star, which also indicates uh, or confirms the fact that the physics of the dileptons is sensitive to the total number of baryons and antibaryons in the system. And uh, therefore, speaking of the dileptons, one has to always think about the total amount of baryons, antibaryons in the system, but not so much about vanishing net baryon density or vanishing net chemical potentials. But the question now is, how does this all acts at the system which is dominated by baryons, meaning uh, we uh, go towards the few GV per nucleon energies. And here there are some challenges which are also addressed by various transport uh, models like Giesen BUU or HSD models um, to implement the in medium effects directly into the transport. Another thing is, of course, to justify the thermalization of the system at this few GeV energy range. And in order to use the success of rap wambach spectral function and compare this, it also to the CIS-18 results, we try to use so-called coarse grain transport approach, which uh, uh, uses the bulk evolution from the microscopic transport models and then locally apply uh, equilib uh, rates from the equilibrium. So what is done, one simulates many events in the transport to obtain smooth space-time distribution of various observables. And then by extracting parameters like temperature, baryon density, chemical potential, also expansion velocity of the system, one calculates the electromagnetic emission rates. And then one compares the results to the experimental data. And here I show you measurements from the CIS-18 energy regime done by Hades, together with the uh, coarse grain calculation using the rap wambach spectral function together with the experimental data. So what one can nicely see here is the thermal rates folded with the coarse grain uh, evolution of the system works very well also at SIS-18 energy range. We also know that the radiation at this uh, collision energies is mainly driven by the baryons. We have only 10% of the pions per baryons, which is approximately factor of 70 lower compared to the SPS energy regime. And this also tells us that in medium spectral function works uh, from the lowest collision energies up to the LHC indicating also that we do have a robust understanding of the emissivity of matter from the lowest and uh, towards the highest collision energies. And uh, additional uh, constraints to the emissivity calculation in this particular spectral function 
could be also done with help of the measurement uh, of the raw coupling to the baryonic resonances, which is now being measured by the Hades collaboration and CIS-18 using uniqueness of the CIS-18 facility producing the pi minus beam, which we then shot on the proton target and can study effects like how exactly raw meson coupled to the baryonic resonances, but also to understand the importance of the pion cloud in all these processes. Our results he shown here with the black dots indicate that the structure of the nucleon is quite complicated and there is an important role played by the pion cloud when we talk about the coupling of the raw to the resonances. Now having this emissivity of meta being really nicely constrained, we can use it also to characterize the fireball in more details. One possibility is to measure the lifetime of the interacting fireball by using the precision measurement of the dilepton spectra, which is indicated here. I use again an A60 data and there are three model calculations, uh, same model calculation by using three different values for the lifetime of the interacting fireball. And from this measurement, one could uh, extract explicitly the lifetime of the fireball. What has been also indicated already in 90s is that if one integrate dilepton yield in the low mass range between 300 to 700 MeV, one can also um, extract the lifetime of the system. And here I show you this dilepton yield integrated in this particular mass range as a function of collision energy. Also here one can see quite smooth behavior of this measurement. And um, here, of course, we are lacking measurements. And this is again exactly the range where one would expect the phase, uh, first order phase transition which could then indicate non-monotonous behavior of such an observable. And indeed, there are first tries to really estimate how does this first order phase transition or even critical point could influence the dilepton yield. Ralph uh, Arno Tripol discussed in his talk about um, this excess yield um, which is being seen close to the critical um, end point, but now we speak about um, nuclear liquid gas phase transition. Another possibility is to use the hydrodynamic simulation and also employ the rapp wambach spectral function, which also indicates that one could expect close to factor of two more dilepton yields when we discuss the first order phase transition scenario which is of course beautiful because factor of two is something what we can see also in experiment. Further characteristics of the fireball is provided by the measurements of the transverse momentum spectra, meaning we can use dileptons as so-called barometer to learn about the collectivity which develops in the system. To do that, we analyze experimentally transverse momentum spectra of the dileptons, and then we plot the slope of this PT spectra as a function of invariant mass of the dileptons. Here you can see measurement from the CIS-18 energy regime, the lowest one we have, showing uh, the kinetic uh, temperature and also expansion velocity, which one extracts by the fit to the data of the well-known simplistic formula. One can see that the temperature extracted in, the, in this way is roughly 70 MeV with the expansion velocity, which is extremely small. And this is different to what we extract from the analysis of the PT spectra of the hadrons, which are radiate, uh, radiated, which are measured at the freeze out. For hadrons, we extract temperature, which is roughly 62 MeV with the quite substantial uh, velocity of 0.34. 
And this type of the measurements very nicely confirm the pictures that dileptons are radiated from the early times of the fireball evolution where the flow did not develop yet. Similar results um, uh, obtained by the SPS measurements and A60 measurements in this case, again, this effective slope parameter is plotted as the dimuon invariant mass spectrum, but of course now extended to the higher invariant masses. And what has been seen by an A60 collaboration is that for the invariant masses below one GeV, this effective slope parameter really grows as a function of mass, indicating uh, also complementarity to the measurements of this slow parameter with the hadrons. But then suddenly after one GeV, this effective temperature drops by approximately 50 MeV, which would indicate that the velocity um, of the system at which this temperature measured is still negligible. However, there were quite some um, uh, or different ways to interpret res these results. And uh, at that time, the discussion about the measurement of the temperature from the invariant mass of dileptons uh, is really originating. Indeed, what we can do, we can use invariant mass of the dileptons to really extract the blue shift independent measure of the temperature. In this case, uh, fitting the invariant mass distribution with the following fit, one extract the temperature, which is as high as 205 MeV, measured with the given precision. And in fact, this is the explicit measurement of the system, which is uh, substantially higher than the pseudo critical value of the temperature extracted from, for example, lattice Kutze decalculation. Where do we stand with this measurement uh, from the other experiments? Um, so far, we have measurements from the hardest at CIS-18, which extracted 72 MeV temperature, and also from an A60, as I said, 205 MeV. And here I show you also model calculation, which uh, do, does not assume any phase transition, but just a smooth change of the temperature as a function of collision energy. However, what one could think of is the scenario where this temperature would indicate a plateau similar to the one that has been seen in the nuclear liquid gas phase transition measured here at GSI and also different facilities already in 95. So similar type of the trend, but now for the temperature extracted from the dileptons would be also a very clean measurement of the uh, first order phase transition in the QCD. To summarize, we have measurement of the invariant mass. We discuss measurement of the inverse slope parameters. We can also look at the elliptic flow and polarization of the virtual photons. And this has been done. What we also can do, we can extract the transport properties of the medium, meaning electrical conductivity, by looking at the very low momentum and very low mass of the dileptons. And here we do not have measurements yet, but I only show you how low down in the mass and also in momentum we can go with the CIS-18 measurements. But all in all, we conclude that in the heavy ion collisions at future EV energy, we produce the source, which is long lived, which is strongly interacting, which is in the local thermal equilibrium. It has a temperature of 72 MeV and density, maximum densities between two to three times of the normal nuclear matter density. And this opens a really nice opportunity to connect the two different uh, colliders, one in the laboratory and one astrophysical colliders. And I explain you this on this transparency. It turned out from the model calculations 
that the temperature and density which occur in the course of the neutron star merger events is very much similar to what I have presented you and what we can extract from the dileptons. These uh, trajectories of the heavy ion reaction and also temperatures and densities which one can extract from the simulation of the neutron star merger events are shown in this diagram. And here you can see that indeed with the collisions of heavy ions at these low energies, we can probe and contribute to the understanding of the equation of state of the hot and dense matter. And this is, Jochen, our endeavor for the upcoming uh, years, of course, within the collaborative research center. And I look very much forward to that. The future is bright. There are many experiments that plan to study dileptons in the near future. Alice with the run three and four, as Peter explained in his talk, star collaboration uh, will also aim or aim now at collecting 16 billion events of gold gold collisions at 200 GeV. There is an opportunity to study dileptons at the fixed target experiment taken at 3 GeV collision energy. There is the plan to do the beam energy scan with the hardest experiment at CS18 going towards lower collision energy. And of course, in the future, we do have CBM experiment at CS100, uh, MPD experiment at Nika being already constructed. And there are nice ideas which are being pushed forward to also measure dimuons with an A60 plus collaboration. And of course, there are many news from the theoretical theory point of view, and all this nicely discussed in this colloquium, which you can listen to by just click to the, to the link. This is my summary, but I do not like to read it. I think I am over the time. Let me finish with a few small remarks. In Hirschek 2016, we have enjoyed Jochen uh, listening about your scientific career presented by many colleagues and, and friends. And this was also the time when you started uh, as a director at SEK Star. And of course, over these many years, you have been leading SET Star and uh, contributed a lot to scientific uh, uh, developments of the center, but also kept it running even during the COVID uh, uh, pandemic situation, which was indeed not easy. And we have heard this from the first speakers. But I am also happy that in between you still had enough energy for our jam sessions in the evening. And <laughs> so it's uh, not Route 66, it's uh, Via Rekia that brought you back from a city star to Darmstadt. And I am extremely happy to have you around and to have all possible scientific discussions with you and preparation for all important events. Sometimes we also have to feel the timelines and I hope very much that we will feel many of those which will go beyond, far beyond 2025. So thank you, Jochen, for all your support over the many years and I enjoy all the time discussing with you. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Tatiana. Thanks, Tatiana, for this overview and these great uh, photos from uh, some time ago, indeed, yeah. Any questions? Jochen? Yeah, I would just like to make comments. I, I think these pictures that you showed, also the video, that was done in Erice. That's right. And I think uh, you, uh, Geert, you were also on one of those with the guitar, I think. Yes. Indeed. These were all in the literature. I, I don't remember when, I think a few years ago. 
2016, uh, 17, when we were writing our CRC proposal, right? So I think an, another comment I want to make about you is uh, you said you don't remember when we first met. I do not know this either, but uh, I think when I came became distinctly aware of you was in fact in Trento at one of the of the workshops there uh, about electromagnetic radiations in the early 2000s. And I distinctly remember that we were sitting in the Piazza Duomo in the evening. You, uh, Hans-Joachim Stroh, Ralf Rapp and myself, and we're talking about physics. I think this was very wonderful. And I think this is when I really first remember you. Okay, thanks Joachim, indeed. There were quite many of our Piazza Domo <laughs> scientific discussions. I could not identify which one was the first one, but indeed 2007 probably that was. Yeah, before, before your PhD. Yeah. That's great. Any other questions or comments? Of course, at the end of the whole session, we'll bring the guitars out and we'll start singing again. Okay, then we go to the next talk by uh, Michael Bubala. Thank you, Gerd, and uh, I'm very happy and very honored uh, to be given the possibility to, to talk at this symposium in honor of, of Jochen. And uh, with my title, I actually tried to find a way to combine the scientific content of my talk with the possibility uh, to share some of my memories with you, which reach back more than 30 years ago. But actually, before going so far, let me just point out that almost exactly five years ago, namely on uh, April 22nd in 2016, we had a farewell colloquium uh, with, uh, in, in Darmstadt for Jochen. And uh, so the colloquium speaker uh, was Wolfram Weidel, Jochen's predecessor in, in Trento. And afterwards, we had a nice celebration in, in the, the, the Landesmuseum. And actually, also many of the former group members joined, joined that. And this is showing now a, a picture of uh, many of, of your former students, and uh, uh, which is now also part of our web page. So actually showing pictures like this these days is, is, is not so trivial. Uh, maybe I was the only person who, who cared about this, but I learned that uh, since the meeting is recorded, uh, I had to ask every single person for their co uh, consent to be shown in my talk. And uh, I'm very proud that I did. And I got the consent by all these people shown on, on, on this uh, uh, picture and, uh, and also on the other pictures. And many of them actually, Jochen, um, have asked me to send, send you their, their greetings and uh, maybe I can uh, do this in more detail later. Um, yeah, actually um, so, some of them also joined join this meeting uh, right now just because I contacted them, I guess. Uh, and in, uh, since we have this picture at hand, let me uh, point out uh, two persons which will play a role in my uh, talk later on, namely there's Dominic Nickel here and uh, Stefano Carignano, and I think they also joined this meeting today. Okay, but uh, now get me back even further in my uh, um, talk about uh, crossing, crossing borders. So uh, actually, in contrast to Tatiana, I exactly remember when I encountered Jochen first. So I was a diploma student in, in Jülich and Jochen was visiting from Illinois at that time. And uh, actually I was sitting at the computer. So, you know, at that time uh, there, there was just a big computer room where everybody had to go. And uh, at some point I, I heard my name because uh, somebody apparently had told Jochen that I could have wave functions of calcium 40. And he was asking me whether I have wave functions of calcium 40. It turned out that I didn't have, but that was our first encounter. Then uh, two years later in 1990, Jochen became what Jerry Brown called a W7 professor. So he 
uh, became a full professor in, in Illinois and at the same time uh, uh, associate professor in Bonn. And at that time, of course, we, we met more frequently in, in Jülich. And then in uh, 1993, we met on the other side of the Atlantic. Namely, I was a um, postdoc in Stony Brook. And uh, right at the beginning, I, I was sent by Jerry Brown uh, together with his student to Urbana to talk to Jochen and uh, to, walk, to work on a common project. Actually, at that time, uh, um, Jochen was not alone, but there, there were also two of his uh, German students, and uh, those were Ralf Rapp, who has been mentioned many times in, in today already. So this is how he was looking at that time, and Thomas Weinzoff later, Thomas Großbölting. And uh, we had a lot of fun. In particular, the four of us, we, one afternoon, we also played tennis uh, with, with Jochen. Uh, none of us was really good, but it was really a, a lot of fun. Unfortunately, I don't have a picture of Jochen of, of that time, but it must roughly look like this, because this was a drawing by his daughter, uh, which he had on his webpage for quite a long time when, when he came in, in Darmstadt. Okay, but of course we were also doing serious things and this is actually our first common paper together with Jerry Brown and uh, the student Zimang Li, where the nuclear pions are. And maybe the interesting aspect here is uh, that actually in this paper, we were presenting arguments based on brown row scaling. So uh, as we have heard later on, uh, uh, Jochen and, and Ralf became famous uh, for alternative scenarios in the context of heavy ion collisions and dileptons. But uh, okay, this was not about but dileptons, but nevertheless, it's interesting. Um, by now, according to Inspire, we have 20 common publications, so it looks still a bit more than, than Arno, but uh, given the, the fact that this is, uh, that I have been in your group for 20 years, uh, this is, you may say this is not so many, and actually here I want to make a point, uh, namely, uh, it was always uh, Jochen's philosophy to give everybody the freedom to do their own things. So actually most of the papers I have written, although I belong to Jochen's group was not with Jochen, but uh, still of course we had many uh, common publications and hopefully there will be more of them in the future. Okay, then in uh, 1996, Jochen came to, to Darmstadt and here I just show a few impressions of, of that time. So we had some excursions to the surrounding uh, castles like uh, Frankenstein Castle just in, in the beginning. Uh, so uh, they were preparing for a Halloween show at that time. Um, here you see um, Andreas Wurzba. This was how I was looking at, okay, Jochen. And uh, later also we had a workshop at Burg Rienek, uh, Jochen presenting his ward. Yeah, um, crossing borders with Jochen, of course, most often I guess I did this in the context of, of workshops, and uh, this has also been mentioned by, by Tatiana. So uh, Jochen was an, the organizer of the Hirschek workshops for om almost 20 years. And uh, I think in about two thirds of the cases, I was a co-organizer there. And of course, he was also the director of the Erich School of Nuclear Physics for more than 10 years, uh, together with Armand Fessler and, and later also with me. Uh, so here, we see the two, I think this picture has been taken actually in 2007 in the lecture hall and then later at some excursion at, at lunch. Here we see the Masala room, which has also been shown by Tatiana together with Horst Lenske. And this was some excursion to Selinunte. Okay, yeah, talking about crossing borders, of course, I must not skip uh, the Comstar conference to Tahiti in 2012, uh, organized by David Blaschke and others. I saw David also in the, in the audience today. Uh, here, for instance, this is uh, the roulotte in Papeete, so some um, simple outside place where one could have simple but very delicious food. And uh, I remember that Jochen uh, liked that very much. So here you see Dirk Rischke and Bernd Jochen Schäfer. Okay, and here Jochen relaxing on, on some excursion. Yeah, okay, and finally, um, that's of course why, why we are here. Jochen became director of ECT Star in Trento. And uh, 
what I regret most is that in these five years, I've been there only once, unfortunately, uh, to, to this very interesting workshop. And uh, what I also remember uh, from this time is uh, that Jochen one evening invited us to his apartment. Uh, so this is the house and uh, it's hard to see, but here is Jochen at, at, the, at the window. And uh, during that time and also uh, one later day when we went downtown, I, I got the feeling that he has really adapted to the Italian way of life and uh, enjoying food and, and, and things like that. Okay, but uh, now I have to turn to the scientific part of my, my talk, which I now called crossing borders in QCD, referring of course to QCD phase boundaries. So this is the standard picture of the QCD phase diagram as has been explained by, by others before already. Um, so this is of course only a sketch. And um, so we have here a hadronic phase and quark gluon plasma and maybe a color superconductor, but the tacit assumption when drawing this kind of phase diagram is always uh, that you assume that the condensates, which are the order parameters for these phase transitions are constant in space. And the question is, uh, is this really true, true? And what about non-uniform phases? And uh, actually this has been discussed uh, more than 10 years ago by, by Dominic Nickel, who I showed in the group picture before, um, within an NGL model. And so this is uh, part of the phase diagram, how it looks like if you allow only for homogeneous phases. So the calculation has been performed in the chiral limit. So here we have a first order phase transition and then there's a tricritical point and then it turns into a second order phase transition in the chiral limit. And you have these two phases. But if you now allow for um, an inhomogeneous phase, so where the condensates are allowed to vary in space, actually the first order phase boundary is completely covered by this inhomogeneous phase here. And also uh, Nickel showed in a different paper that within that model, actually um, this so-called Lipschitz point, which is the point where the three phases, so the inhomogeneous and the two homogeneous ones, the restored and the broken phase where they meet, uh, that uh, this point exactly coincides with the point where um, earlier was, uh, I mean, in the homogeneous, purely homogeneous case, uh, there was just the tricritical point. Okay, later um, we, and also together with uh, Stefano Carignano, we made, uh, and, and, and also others, uh, made, uh, investigated, investigated this scenario under various uh, model extensions and variations, and it turned out to be rather robust. And I should also mention that there have, had been earlier papers on this before. Now, what I want to talk today about is uh, most of these calculations, although not all of them, had been done within the chiral limit. And so the question is, what is the effect of explicit chiral symmetry breaking on these inhomogeneous phases? And uh, so there had been calculations before, but they were somewhat contradictory. So already in this old paper by, by Dominic, um, he performed calculations also introducing a, within the NGL model, a, a finite bare quark mass. Um, so these three phase, inhomogeneous phases, which are sketched here, or actually they, those are calculations, um, uh, correspond to a vanishing bare quark mass and then five or 10 MeV, which are kind of realistic parameters. And you see that the inhomogeneous phase gets smaller when, when the bare quark mass is enhanced, but it uh, um, stays there. And also uh, this uh, kind of Lifschitz or pseudo Lifschitz point uh, seems still to reach to, to the critical endpoint. On the other hand, uh, more recently, there was a calculation by Andersen and Kneschke within the quark meson model. And they find that there's no inhomogeneous phase for a pion mass, which is uh, larger than uh, about a quarter of the physical value. So what is shown here is at t equal to, to zero, these are the two phase boundaries of, of the inhomogeneous phase as a function of the pion mass. And so you see it uh, in the chiral limit, you still have this inhomogeneous phase, but then it gets uh, smaller and finally vanishes at, at this value. And so the, the question is, can we uh, 
shed some light into, into this issue. Actually, so it, the, the point is that these are not only two different models, and uh, as I will show later, they are not so different, uh, but uh, they, they also um, made different ansets for the inhomogeneous modulation, so for the spatial shape of the, of the condensate. So uh, Dominic Nickel used uh, a so-called real king crystal, which, which is some kind of domain wall soliton uh, solution, and they used a simpler um, chiral density wave, which is actually known not to be a self-consistent solution anymore if you go away from the chiral limit. And uh, so our aim was to study this more system systematically without making any assumptions about the, the shape within the stability and the ginsburg landau analysis. Okay, uh, so we did this within both models. So the NGL model and the quark meson model, but just uh, uh, for definiteness, let, let me explain this for the quark meson model, which has also been introduced by Arno Tripold before. So it's basically the same model. So we have a quark field psi coupled to sigma and pion fields via some Yukawa coupling, which uh, in Arno's case was called H and we call it G here. And then the, the mesons have some kinetic part and, and uh, potential. And there is also some explicitly chiral symmetry breaking term, um, which is param uh, with a parameter C. Okay. And now um, in, in the next step, and this is different from what, what, I, what Arno discussed, uh, I will stick to the mean field approximation. So I will replace the quantum fields sigma and pi by their classical expectation values, which I will also call sigma and pi for simplicity. Um, for the pion, I, I assume that this expectation value is just only the, the isospin three component. But the main thing here is that uh, I will not assume that these mean fields are spatially constant, but of course, in order to uh, um, study inhomogeneous phases, I will allow them to depend on, on the spatial variable X, although I assume that they are time independent. And actually, uh, so as I said, I will stick to the mean field approximation for the time being, but at the very end of my talk, I will also um, discuss uh, about inhomogeneous phases beyond the mean field approximation. Okay, so having this model, then we would like to calculate the, uh, the um, effective potential or the grand potential per, per volume at some temperature T or, and chemical potential mu. And within the mean field approximation, this is readily written down. So basically it can be decomposed into two parts. One is the mesonic part, which is basically just an integral over the, over the um, potential part and the kinetic part of, of, of the mesons. And uh, for the quarks within mean field approximation, you can uh, integrate them out and you get this typical trace log term of an inverse quark propagator. And the inverse prop quark propagator is given here. And, but uh, so the quarks get dressed by these sigma and pi on mean fields, which uh, now depend on X. And uh, this general X dependence makes, of course, things extremely difficult. So for instance, if you go to momentum space, it simply means that momentum is not conserved because the, the condensates, uh, you can exchange uh, momentum with the condensates. And so already the, the evaluation of this trace log is difficult. And in addition, you want finally minimize uh, the thermodynamic potential with, which is now a functional of, of these functions with respect to these functions. And uh, so in, in, in general, this is extremely difficult of course, and uh, has not yet been done in, in full glory. So the strategy we want to follow here are now, uh, the first one is a stability analysis. And uh, I think for many in the audience uh, who are familiar uh, with the uh, P-wave pion condensation uh, and things like that. Uh, yeah, uh, you should know how this works, but, but nevertheless, let me explain this in a bit more detail. So basically what, what we do is, uh, so we have uh, um, uh, our mean field thermodynamic potential. And in the first step, we minimize this with, with respect to homogeneous mean fields, um, which is of course much simpler and a uh, standard thing. So for homogeneous fields, so uh, okay, we will find a minimum for the sigma field, which we call sigma bar. And uh, since we are mostly interested in, 
in the chiral in, in, in the case where chiral symmetry is explicitly broken, the pion field will, will come out to be zero. But then we study the effect of small inhomogeneous fluctuations about this these uh, minimal uh, homogeneous solutions. And uh, so the, if, if then the effect of these inhomogeneous fluctuations is to lower the thermodynamic potential, it means of course that the homogeneous phase is unstable, uh, meaning that the phase must be, must be inhomogeneous. Um, and uh, so therefore it is a sufficient criterion uh, for an inhomogeneous phase. It is not necessary because it could still be that the homogeneous phase is stable against small fluctuations, but unstable against large fluctuations. But in any case, the, the, the good thing is that we don't need to make any ansatz for, for the spatial shape of, of, of these functions. Okay, and therefore in particular, of course, it is well suited to identify second order phase transitions towards the in, inhomogeneous phase because then these fluctuations are by definition smaller, getting zero at the phase boundary. Now the Ginsburg-Landau analysis, which we also performed and which I will not explain here in, in detail is very similar. Uh, there's just one additional thing. So in the stability analysis, we assume that these fluctuations are small in amplitude, but we don't make any assumption about uh, the gradient. So they could still have large gradients. And in the Ginsburg-Landau analysis, uh, we, we also expand in small gradients. And uh, this has the advantage that uh, this method then is very well uh, suited to identify the critical and Lifshitz points as had been done by, by Nickel in the paper I mentioned in the beginning. Okay, but now let's go a bit in more detail to the stability analysis. So we write down our sigma field as the uh, minimal homogeneous piece plus some fluctuation. And uh, okay, the, for the pion, uh, there, there is only the fluctuation. And then uh, we go back to the stressed quark propagator, which I mentioned in the beginning. And of course, this can be decomposed in the same way. So now we have some piece which only depends on, on the homogeneous part. And this just looks like a free non-interacting -inter quark with some homogeneous mass M proportional to, to the sigma field. And then we have the fluctuations, which is some kind of self energy. And with this, we go then to, to the thermodynamic potential and expand it in orders of uh, in powers of, of, of the fluctuations. And uh, uh, I don't want to discuss now all the details here. Uh, uh, basically, you just end up with uh, different orders. So there's the, the lowest order with no fluctuation and then the uh, linear order in the fluctuation and, and the quadratic order. And that's all what, what we need. Um, and, but the nice thing here is now, if you now look at the trace log, then it contains not the full propagator, but basically the, 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 this S0, which we just said is the quark with a homogeneous mass. And uh, there we just know how it, how it looks like. And uh, so uh, the essential thing is that in the end, these, these expressions can be evaluated in particular if we go to momentum space. And this is what we do next. So for the fluctuations, we just uh, take their Fourier transforms uh, in momentum space. So we have some delta sigma of Q and delta sigma, uh, delta pi of Q. And then we plug this into the previous expressions and evaluate them. And what we'll find then first for the linear term is that it exactly vanishes um, if, and that was what we did, uh, the sigma bar is just the homogeneous minimum or a stationary point in uh, stationary homo homogeneous solution. This is actually not as trivial as you might think because I mean, okay, so uh, sigma bar is the uh, is a stationary point homogeneous solution, but for the delta sigma, of course, we, we still allow that it is inhomogeneous. And so one may naively think that uh, still there could be some contribution to the, to the linear order, but it turns out to the linear order, only the Q equal to zero. So only the constant part of, of this fluctuation contributes. And then by assumption, this of course should not contribute because sigma bar is already the lowest constant solution. And basically this is just then equivalent to the homogeneous gap equation. Okay, anyway, so we, this means we have to go to the quadratic term and here we find that it is possible that the quadratic term lowers the, the thermodynamic potential. So here we have an integral over, over the momentum and then we have here our Fourier components which can be 
anything, so arbitrary. But the coefficients of that, and this is what is well known from, from P wave pion condensation, is uh, the co coefficients are given just by the inverse static sigma and, and pion propagators. So the, the propagator at zero energy and finite momentum. And now you see, so there's a minus sign here. These quantities are just strictly positive. So if this inverse propagator is, becomes positive in some momentum region Q, then we could just choose uh, the, the Fourier components in such a way that they are just present in for, for those Q, Q, and then that would lead to, to some instability. So that would lead to a lowering of the thermodynamic potential. So um, yeah, and this is again here. So the homogeneous ground state is unstable if now these um, functions are positive in some, some region of Q. That, that's all we have to look for. And uh, so if you just look at these um, for point particles in vacuum, you, you find they are negative. So then everything is stable. But due to the interactions, of course, this can change. And the second order phase boundary then is just given by, by those um, in cases of uh, or by those um, combinations of mu and t, where this in the inverse propagator or one of them just touches the, the, the zero line at some value of q. And the value of q is then exactly the, the critical mode. And uh, the Lifshitz point or pseudo Lifshitz point is then given by the uh, just uh, the point where this q goes to zero. OK, so let me come to the numerical results. So this is uh, what I want to show at some recent paper together with Stefano and uh, Leonard Kurt. Um, so OK, we fixed our parameters of the model first in, in vacuum. We did it in the following way. So first, we went to the chiral limit. So this c is equal to 0. And then we fixed the, the other parameters just to some uh, to the pion k constants and some values of the uh, constituent quark mass and, and, and the sigma mass. And then afterwards, we increase um, uh, this explicitly symmetry breaking uh, parameter c uh, such that m pi gets non zero and uh, keep the other parameters fixed. And then we can uh, plot everything as functions of, of m pi. OK, and this is what uh, such a phase diagram typically looks like. So we have. Uh, um, uh, so this is for some physical value of, of the pion mass, m pi, um, temperature axis, chemical potential. And this uh, shaded area, this is exactly the area where the instability occurs. And uh, OK, so you see there's quite some, some uh, area where, where we really have an instability. Um, for comparison, we also plotted the phase boundaries of, of a particular ansatz, so the one which was also used by, by Dominic Nick, Nickel, this real king crystal. And you see, OK, here and this uh, phase boundary, which is a second order phase boundary, exactly coincides with the boundary of the instability line. Whereas here, uh, the true inhomogeneous phase is actually larger than the instability region, uh, just because uh, here it is not unstable against uh, small fluctuations, but against large fluctuations. Um, I indicated some value of lambda here. This is simply due to the fact that we have loops which we have to regularize. And here we just have uh, taken some finite value of lambda. On the other hand, the model is in, in principle uh, renormalizable. So we can send lambda to infinity. And effectively, we have done this here by choosing a very large value. And as you have seen, uh, sorry, by comparison, is uh, the inhomogeneous phase gets smaller, but it still survives here. There are some issues about these large values, but I don't want to discuss this here. So now in the following, I will just show this right phase boundary, which is the one where the stability analysis can be trusted most. And uh, uh, so this is shown here. So the solid lines are the, these right phase boundaries from the um, restored or almost restored phase to the inhomogeneous phase on, on the left-hand side for different values of the pion mass. So um, zero means this is the chiral limit. And then we increase the pion mass. And you see, OK, these phase boundaries get, get shorter. And so the upper point is just this pseudo Lifshitz point. They get shorter, but they, they survive um, well beyond the physical pion mass. On the other hand, what is also plotted here, and maybe hardly visible, are these 
dashed or dotted lines here. And those are, so, so the, the instability uh, for the, for the um, solid lines are due to the sigma fluctuations. And the, the dashed lines are the instabilities which would occur uh, due to the pion fluctuations, but they are of course irrelevant because before we had already uh, the instability due to the sigma fluctuations. So we, we see that the relevant fluctuations here are the, the sigma fluctuations and, and not the pion fluctuations. Okay, now um, let me um, uh, make some more general discussion about uh, uh, the two models I mentioned in the beginning, so the NGL model and the quark meson model, and uh, we want uh, to discuss now the, the fate of the Lifshitz point and these critical points uh, for in the chiral limit and in the explicitly broken case. So in the chiral limit, this is uh, what I mentioned in the very beginning. This was uh, Nichols' paper in 2009. Uh, he had shown that um, in the NGL model in the chiral limit, so uh, this Lifshitz point, so where the three phases meet, exactly coincides with the tricritical point, which you would have in the purely homogeneous phase. And uh, later on, we studied this for the quark meson model. And it turned out that one gets the same result if we choose the sigma mass to be equal in vacuum, to be equal uh, twice the, the, the quark mass. Um, so in the NGL model, this is what always comes out automatically. In the NGL model, in the chiral limit, the sigma mass is always twice the quark mass. But in the quark meson model, you have one more parameter and one more freedom. So you could choose them independently. But if you choose them in the way it, is, uh, it, is, it comes out in the NGL model, then one also finds that the Lifshitz point coincides with the tricritical point. So the uh, first order phase boundary is com completely uh, covered. If you choose a larger sigma mass, actually the, the um, inhomogeneous phase gets larger. And if you choose a smaller sigma mass, it gets smaller. OK, then we investigated this for the explicitly broken phase. And it turns out that basically not much changes. So this is some uh, general Ginsburg-Landau result. Uh, so in the explicitly broken um, case, of course, there is no second order phase transition here anymore. So there's just a smooth crossover. And therefore, there's strictly speaking, there are only two phases, homogeneous and inhomogeneous. Um, and so we called this tip of the inhomogeneous phase the pseudo Lifshitz point. And this one in the NGL model exactly coincides again with the critical endpoint. And again, in the quark meson model, um, the same thing happens if in the chiral limit, we uh, choose the sigma mass to be equal to the, to the to twice the quark mass. So basically, one always ends up in this case with, with the same um, results. And of course, now you may say these are only model results, but um, at least all these results are independent of the model parameters, except for the sigma mass here. Um, so this basically means if you believe in the models, uh, when, when they come to predict a critical endpoint, you maybe should also consider the possibility that there's an inhomogeneous phase because this is the same thing these models predict. Okay, yeah, actually uh, there are further applications of these techniques, uh, which I originally wanted to, to discuss uh, uh, for, uh, then I noticed that I probably would not have enough time or I should have uh, shown less photos in the beginning maybe. Uh, so let me just mention that we also included, uh, or we, we um, discussed the effect of, of strange quarks, um, which was kind of interesting because we know in, um, so what we discussed here is what happens if we have uh, three flavors and then we choose uh, very small strange quark masses. Then we know that of course, in the case of very small um, quark masses eventually, uh, the phase transition at zero chemical potential should become first order in the homogeneous phase. So, which means that by lowering the strange quark mass, uh, the critical point, the, the, the critical endpoint should move towards the, the mu equal zero axis. And so the question was whether the Lifshitz point uh, follows this movement, because then it would mean that the inhomogeneous phase also goes down to, to, to zero. And there might then, if this holds in QCD, be a chance to um, see this maybe in lattice QCD. It turned out within this analysis that this, that this does not happen. So in, in the three flavor case, 
for physical parameters, the two points are still almost coinciding, but they split and uh, only the uh, critical point goes down. Uh, we also had some interesting um, collaboration uh, with uh, Mark Wagner and Mark Winstel from Frankfurt uh, working on the two plus one dimensional uh, gross niveau model within lattice field methods. And uh, so we back up the calculations with, with our continuous continuum stability analysis. And that was also very interesting because there we found uh, that uh, within this two plus one dimensional gross niveau model, as long as we have a finite uh, regulator, so in our case, a uh, momentum or uh, Pauli Villar cutoff, and in their case, uh, of course, a finite lattice spacing, there always was an inhomogeneous phase, but if we send our cutoff to infinity, it, it disappears. So actually this is then just the cutoff effect. And something which I would like to do in the future is now to extend these techniques to, uh, to QCD. So uh, earlier we had actually already some calculation within Dyson Schwinger QCD with uh, Daniel Müller and also Jochen was involved in that uh, using a rather simple truncation and uh, a certain shape of the inhomogeneous um, modulation. But of course, one could also perform such kind of uh, stability analysis, and that would probably allow us to go beyond these uh, simple truncations. Now, the last point, I'm actually almost over time, uh, I just briefly want to, to mention is now everything I discussed so far was just in mean field, but of course, um, we, uh, the question is, do these inhomogeneous phases survive also fluctuations beyond mean field. And there are arguments that this might not be the case, uh, that the long range order at least uh, goes away. Uh, so we would like to perform a functional randomization group uh, stability analysis. And actually this, uh, such a calculation has been done by Arno Tripold uh, a couple of years ago. And Jochen was also involved there, Bernd Jochen Schäfer and Lorenz von Smekal. And uh, I would just like uh, to present his results. So what is shown here, these lines are basically our in, is basically the inverse pion, static pion propagator, um, which we discussed before at zero energy and finite momentum, but at some given renormalization scale K. And uh, so what, what they found here was that uh, in the ultraviolet, everything is negative. So as we discussed before, when, once this gets dives into the positive area, this is a sign for an instability. And then uh, moving down uh, or flowing down in, in, in the momentum scale, in the, in the RG scale, uh, eventually indeed uh, there is a region where this propagator gets positive, but if you flow down further on, it gets, gets ne completely negative again. And uh, so it's not quite clear how to interpret this. Um, anyway, I think one should do this redo this calculation more systematically because as I said before, first of all, um, so um, this was done for the for the pion propagator, and I, I, I discussed before that the sigma fluctuation is more relevant. But actually, I talked to Arno, and he said he has done this for the sigma as well, and it looks similar. The other thing is that um, I think he has done this for a relatively low sigma mass, and uh, also there I said that uh, so probably for this sigma mass, even the mean field would not be. Uh, not have a, an inhomogeneous phase. So probably we should do this more systematically and this is what actually um, is planned. Okay, so at the very end, let me come back to the beginning of my talk. So as I said, at, uh, almost exactly five years ago, there was Jochen's farewell in Darmstadt. And what I show here is uh, Wolfram Weiss's um, final slide. Uh, so you see here, there's already Villa Tambosi in, in Trento and uh, he wrote, think like a proton and stay positive. Um, unfortunately, nowadays uh, in COVID times, the word positive has a somewhat negative touch. And uh, so here's now my final slide. So uh, this is unfortunately not Villa Tambosi, but the theory center in Darmstadt. And uh, uh, so welcome back Jochen and stay negative. Thank you very much. Thanks Michael. Yeah, thanks, Mikael. Great talk and good choice of photos as well. Uh, David has a question. Yeah, very short comment. You pointed out the role of the sigma meson mass. I wanted to 
make a comment that in non-local extensions of the model, the sigma meson mass would come below two times the uh, quark mass. So would this somehow be interesting for your scenarios? No, actually, I think one, one, one has to see. So the sigma meson mass actually comes in, in, in a very indirect way. Uh, so what, what we do is we, we have in, in the quark meson model, we have to, to fit the model parameters in, in some particular way, of course. And uh, uh, it turns out that in, in the end, these parameters are related then, of course, to the sigma meson mass. And uh, it, it turns out that these, uh, this has these nice features. So in the, uh, in the, in the um, models you mentioned, um, uh, probably one has to see it. It's probably different. So mm -hmm. I don't know. Okay, but it's you. an interesting thing one should look at, maybe. Uh, I have a question about the FRG. I think it was the previous, so previous, previous slide. Yeah. Yeah, so here, so if at the intermediate scale, this propagate or goes say, positive, then do you have to change the FRG formulation? Because you have to then make it inhomogeneous, so to speak. Yeah, well, okay. Um, so probably Anu can also say something to this, but this is exactly what they argued in, in, in their paper. Uh, so they, they did not change it, but they said, okay, uh, below the scale, uh, the analysis becomes meaningless because in principle, we did not offer the system the, uh, the degrees of freedom uh, it wants to go to. On the other hand, of course, you can say, but uh, nevertheless, in the end, uh, the, the solution for K equal to zero is a perfectly stable one. So it could also maybe mean that indeed this is some way to get into uh, some other solution which even uh, would be stable against uh, small fluctuations uh, in, the, in the infrared, but, but uh, could nevertheless be a more a better solution. But I think this really is not completely clear to me. Okay, thanks. Um... Okay, thanks. I see no further questions. So we come to the uh, final talk, which is by uh, Sandro uh, Stringari. I see Sandro, yeah, I see you. Yes, sir. I'm very happy to, to have this opportunity to say uh, my uh, thanks to uh, Jorgen Wambach for his role, uh, uh, for his scientific profile, of course, uh, but in particular for uh, what he did uh, during this years uh, uh, of directorship uh, at ECT. So I, I am no longer a nuclear physicist. And so I will not report here uh, 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 scientific works uh, on nuclear physics, uh, 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 but I would like uh, uh, rather to, 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 to talk and to say something about uh, uh, the initiatives of collaborations uh, between ACT stores and the local scientific environment uh, during uh, uh, the, the Jokens directorship. And I, I, uh, I uh, you will uh, uh, see soon uh, the, the slides. Uh, and this first slide uh, summarizes uh, the topics uh, that I, I would like to, 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 to discuss briefly uh, in this uh, 20 minutes. First, I would like to mention the uh, organization of the ECT's workshop, uh, which involved uh, 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 the, the participation as organizers of people from, uh, from um, uh, the, the Trento environment. Uh, and, uh, uh, and in particular, uh, uh, all this uh, workshop uh, are fostering a novel direction of research uh, of interdisciplinary interest. And, uh, and this, I think, is an important point that we have uh, been discussing a lot during the last uh, months, also within the, uh, with the um, board of ECT store and uh, with Jochen about uh, the possibility of uh, uh, giving the right uh, and the proper profile to, to, the, uh, to ECT store, also in connection with the so-called related areas, which from the very beginning uh, have played uh, an important uh, a role in the activity of ECT stores, but now uh, 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 might become even more important. And so this is the first uh, um, 
the point that I would like to, to, see, to discuss. And then I would like to say something about the role that you can play the, in connection with, the, with the Renzo Leonardi, in particular, uh, the writing uh, of uh, a review article on the 25th anniversary of this stars uh, that was completed and uh, published just a few months after the, the, the death of Renzo. And this, uh, in some sense, it was fortunate that uh, it, it was possible to complete this review article when Renzo was still alive. And in this connection, I would like to mention also the event in memory of Renzo Leonardi that uh, uh, we organized uh, the ATCT Star, and that was uh, an important event for the for the life of the city stars, but not only because it was a, a, an important moment uh, where, when uh, uh, the community of the city stars uh, met uh, the community of uh, Trento. Uh, uh, and, uh, and so this is also an important event uh, which strengthened the, 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 the connection, which in my opinion are important for the future. Sandro, can I, can I ask you, can you send the slides maybe to Susan as well, because they haven't arrived here yet? Uh, 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 yes, I can. Uh, I will try. Uh, just me. Uh, so I am very sorry. Oh, wait, no, they're here now. They're here now. They just came in. The, it arrived there? The, the mail arrived there? The mail just arrived, but on... But I don't see an attachment. I don't see the attachment at all. This, this Maybe send it again to Susan or, or to Barbara. Yes. yes. Uh, because this concerns the organization of ECT's workshop, and I want I would like to mention uh, um, uh, to mention them very briefly, because they uh, they emphasize the the the, 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 the interdisciplinarities of these activities involving uh, also the university and the, and the other research institutes in Trento. Can we move to the next slide? Okay. So I put here a, a, a first meeting where I was one of the organizers. This is 2015, which is the year before the arrival of of Jochen, but I want to, to put this because the title and the topics of this meeting are very significant, especially for the following activities of uh, interactions between the community of cold atoms and the high energy physics. And by the way, this is a, a very, now a very rather uh, important directions of uh, international research. And uh, 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 especially the last uh, uh, times with the new, uh, projects on quantum computing and the possibility of uh, using uh, uh, quantum simulators for uh, the studying uh, properties of high energy physics. Uh, this is, in my opinion, uh, uh, an important topic where ACT played uh, already from, uh, uh, some years ago some role. Uh, and uh, I, I would like also to mention this because uh, this was in this uh, meeting, uh, we had the possibility to meet uh, Philip Hauke, who was uh, uh, one of the speakers of the conference. Uh, and uh, uh, now, uh, Philip Hauke, after winning an ERC starting grant in Heidelberg, uh, has moved to Trento. And so, and this is reinforcing this activity of uh, uh, quantum simulation and quantum computing. And then uh, we had uh, in the following years, uh, this workshop on the question of state in quantum and body systems and Francesco Pederiva, oh no, I, I, go, I go back, okay was one of the organizers together with Stefano Giorgini. And this is also very interdisciplinary topics uh, where, uh, uh, um, where uh, the, the fields of nuclear physics, uh, condensed metal uh, uh, physics uh, have a very important uh, uh, the common interest. The, the, the screen disappeared. Yes. In particular, the, the organization uh, the, uh, the Bruno Giacomazzo organized this workshop on nuclear astrophysics uh, uh, in the gravitational wave era. And then we had uh, this another workshop on, uh, on uh, 
uh, computational methods applied to uh, biophysics, uh, and it's also interdisciplinarity uh, uh, interest. And, uh, and finally, this last uh, workshop that was organized by, by uh, Massimo Rinaldi and, uh, and uh, Jacopo Carusotto, again uh, on uh, links between high energy and gravitational cosmology and uh, condensed matter and the optical systems. And so you, you can see that all the, the workshop that were organized with the, an important role played by the Trento people uh, concern interdisciplinary uh, aspects of uh, science. And this is something that I wanted to, to, to point out. Uh, go on, please, next slide. <clears throat> Okay, uh, uh, go on, uh, continue. Uh, 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 this I already mentioned. That this is the paper uh, uh, that was published in the uh, uh, Nuclear Physics uh, Journal uh, about uh, the uh, review on the, the, the history of physical star. And I think this is very important uh, for the history of uh, our community and uh, uh, strengthened again the, the, the relationship between ECT and uh, and uh, the fixed departures, in particular the role of Renzo Leonardi, who passed away sadly uh, uh, soon after. Uh, 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 go on, please. And in fact, uh, the event in memory of Renzo Leonardi was also an important uh, 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 and touching event in our recent history. Uh, uh, with Jochen, I wrote, and this is the only, <laughs> It's a paper, if you like, that I wrote together with him. But I'm very uh, proud of having this possibility to, to write a memory of uh, uh, Renzo Leonardi. And, uh, and, uh, uh, and, uh, and then this was followed by the organization of an event, the next slide, that was organized at TCT in, in February, uh, uh, 18 February, 2020. And this was uh, the last, uh, uh, event in person that was organized at TCT because immediately after the pandemic and the COVID locked everything in our, in our activities. This event of Remember Renzo Leonardi was an important, as I said before, because it put together the scientific community of TCT and the local both scientific, but also not only all of the friends and the, and the community of Trento participated. And the event was very successful from the point of view of the participation. Uh, go on, please. Uh, uh, during this event, uh, it was decided to, to, to dedicate, uh, uh, even before, but to, to officially to communicate the dedication of the big seminar room to Renzo. And to, and to uh, uh, next, uh, please, uh, to put a plaque in the historical building, uh, recalling uh, the role of Renzo uh, in, the, in the foundation of the city star and uh, also in initiating the restoration of the Villa Tambosi where the uh, ECT is now um, um, located. Uh, uh, next, please. <clears throat> okay, uh, next. Uh, and this is uh, an important uh, point that was already mentioned at the beginning of uh, this afternoon, the, the role played by uh, Jochen in uh, uh, reinforcing the activity on, uh, on quantum cells and technology. Uh, and in particular, ECT is now uh, a part of this initiative, which involves also the university, the, uh, the, uh, and the CNR. And uh, Jochen during a uh, uh, couple of years, he was also the leader of a work package de de dedicated to quantum simulator. And they played an important role also in the selection of the activities uh, uh, of, uh, of uh, QTN. And uh, uh, the last uh, uh, significant, uh, let's say, decision was uh, by City Star, uh, uh, was the decision to support the initiative to, 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 to build a quantum computer in, in Padova. And this is a, an important uh, link with the Italian scientific community. And again, uh, this is fostering uh, the, uh, new research directions uh, uh, in the future. And I would like to come to the last uh, uh, part, my presentation, 
Well, I, I, I would talk about the, the, uh, the physics, finally, uh, unfortunately. Uh, and uh, in 2018, uh, okay, I, I applied for the, the financing by, uh, from a QTM uh, of a PhD position. In this topic, uh, self-bound quantum droplets. And by, idea, uh, by the way, the idea of uh, choosing this was also inspired by a, 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 an old paper that I wrote with David Brink, eh? and that was mentioned by Angela uh, um, uh, um, uh, the, uh, at the beginning this afternoon on the evaporation of, uh, of quantum droplets. And uh, 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 this proposal was accepted, and uh, this position was opened, and uh, a very good and excellent student from Padova, Santo Rotuzzo, was enrolled. And uh, soon uh, we decided to orient uh, uh, his activity in a broader direction, which includes quantum droplets, but uh, is broader in the sense uh, that cover the, the physics of super solidity dipolar gases. And this is an emergent uh, research direction of atomic physics uh, with many interdisciplinary uh, uh, um, aspects uh, involving uh, um, solid state uh, physics, uh, helium physics, condensed matter, but only, but also very likely a uh, 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 neutron star and uh, um, high energy physics. The main point of this uh, dipolar uh, uh, um, uh, 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 forces is that uh, they are uh, 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 long range and they contain uh, both attractive and repulsive components. Uh, they, they, they are anisotropic uh, and they uh, are uh, the origin formation of uh, self-bound quantum droplets, which are the analog of atomic nuclei, but also of the challenging super solid configurations, which is created by the equivalence of different uh, droplets. Uh, at the end, uh, we, we didn't uh, write papers, uh, uh, joint papers with Jochen about these things, but uh, Jochen participated uh, on a regular basis at the discussion and uh, is, is stimulating with the many suggestions and useful advices. And I would like to, to spend uh, uh, the last, my last five minutes uh, to, to uh, uh, present a little bit uh, the physics of these systems and the main result that uh, Santoro Cusso uh, uh, obtained uh, uh, in collaboration with me and uh, Alessio Recati. First, uh, what are supersolids? Supersolids are many body systems which exhibit the, the simultaneous breaking, uh, uh, spontaneous breaking of two continuous symmetries. These are the gauge symmetry or phase symmetry, which is typical of superfluid systems, and the translational invariance, which is at the basis of crystallization and the, the, the structure of solids. Th this effect has been uh, uh, so to, uh, for a long time in solid, but uh, without success in solid helium, and was uh, triggered very much by this important paper, Tony Leggett. Uh, again, uh, we, go, we come back to Tony, who's David Brink uh, in the first afternoon. Uh, and can a solid be superfluid? The question uh, is not trivial, and uh, 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 with this paper, Leggett, uh, uh, in some sense, opened uh, the theoretical uh, investigation uh, uh, to, together with other important papers also by other uh, that I have not the time to mention. Next slide, please. Uh, 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 Santo Racuzzo, when he was a student in uh, the master's student in Padova, wrote uh, uh, this paper that uh, was the first important uh, theoretical uh, calculation of the supersolid phase using dipolar gases. And immediately after, uh, also stimulated by the idea contained in this paper, the, 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 there were three experiments, uh, next slide please, uh, 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 in, uh, uh, in three different city in Florence, uh, in uh, Stuttgart and uh, in Innsbruck, uh, well, uh, uh, they uh, obtained evidence, experimental evidence for supersolidity in the same geometry that Tampo had uh, 
uh, had uh, identified the, with this paper. Then we And we decided uh, in Trento to run uh, 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 activity connected with the superfluidity of a dipole uh, supersolid. In particular, we, we wrote uh, uh, four papers. Three are, uh, have been already published, and the one, the last one, that was put on the archive just uh, one a few weeks ago. And the first paper concerned the, the Goldstone mode. Uh, we can go to the next slide. Uh, uh, to, uh, because uh, when you have a two spontaneous work in CMIT, uh, uh, you can expect uh, at least two gapless Goldstone modes. Uh, and uh, 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 in this paper that was written in collaboration experimentalist of Florence, uh, we were able to predict uh, the, 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 the dispersion of these uh, two uh, gapless excitations. Uh, and uh, the specialist to measure them. And so this was the, the really, uh, important breakthrough in the field uh, because this was the first measurement of this new Goldstone mode uh, produced by the crystallization of the superfluid. Uh, 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 next, please. In a second paper, we, uh, we uh, uh, 20, this, we uh, uh, calculated uh, the, the, the properties of the scissors mode in the super solid phase. And is the system super, uh, uh, super fluid or and the, the scissor mode? We already investigated in the past in other systems, in particular, starting with nuclear physics, the work of um, Kim Richter. Uh, 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 it's a uh, very natural uh, 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 collective the loss for the identification of the superfluid. Immediately after, the people in Florence a one agreement with the prediction, confirming the superfluid of the supersolids. Next slide, please. Another, another important properties of superfluidity is the existence of quantized vortices. And uh, if we create a super solid uh, uh, with no rotating, uh, we have a crystal structure. And what happens if you rotate this super solid? The, uh, the, is this system able to host uh, quantized vortices? The answer is yes. There are no experiments so far because it's very difficult to generate uh, for in the, this moment uh, uh, um, two dimensional uh, uh, super solids. Uh, I would like to mention the last work that we have written on these topics. Next slide. And this is a, 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 a very, very stimulating uh, paper, I, I hope, that might stimulate a new theoretical experimental work. Because what we have found that if you put these gases in a box potential, which is the situation, uh, the usual experiments are done in harmonic traps. But if you put in a box potential, then a new phenomenon takes place. And this is a kind of meniscus effect uh, and that uh, we understood and we, we discussed in this paper. And according to this uh, uh, effect, uh, uh, no, the majority of atoms, instead of remaining in, in the center of the box, uh, try to go near the border, near the edge. And there they can be, uh, from the left to the right, uh, can be a, a standard superfluids, uh, but can give rise to super solidity. And uh, if you uh, uh, change uh, even more the, the value of the scattering length, uh, the, these clusters become completely independent and you have an edge crystal. And this is a very beautiful uh, um, uh, new configuration that uh, we hope experimentally will be able to reproduce. Uh, so this concludes my, my um, presentation. Let's, last slide. Uh, I will just uh, to conclude uh, saying that uh, during uh, uh, the ECT star directorship, uh, you can contribute in a very important way to reinforce to reinforcing the collaborative activities involving ECT star. 
and the trained to scientific environment. And in addition to the historical field of nuclear physics, which is the, the, the core of the activity of ACTs, also the area of the so-called related areas is expected to further grow and uh, uh, we anticipate stimulating times for the future years. And uh, we hope to continue to, 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 to work along this direction. Uh, and, uh, and personally, I would like to thank again uh, Joachim and uh, with the hope to meet him uh, again soon and, to, and, and hopefully to start also to real uh, scientific collaboration with him. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sandro. Thanks a lot for this uh, 